Hi, everyone. Hello to the people on Zoom we can't see, but thank you for joining us. Um, I'm Professor Lee Fellow, and I am very delighted to thank you all and welcome you to the Sydney Dementia Network annual conference. Um, I read a paper, well, I read lots of papers, but I read a paper and it told me the average number of authors in PubMed articles in 2000 and in 2020. Who wants to guess what the average number of authors in a published article in, 20, in 2000 was? CL out. Four, correct. Amy Brummer wins a prize. Okay, so what was the average number of authors in 2020? Did anyone say six? Just someone said, yes, great, six. Jackie wins a prize for saying six, uh, 6.25. Um, so I think that we're realizing that it's not possible to solve wicked problems in the world as, as an individual, but even as a unidisciplinary team. So I can't just work with other psychologists, much as I love Sharon, um, and that we really need to be interdisciplinary in research, which is why I'm so pleased that you're all here, that there's a big range of different people here, and you should make a new friend today, perhaps outside your group or your discipline, because you need that person's expertise. I'm here to suck up all the knowledge from the speakers and especially the panel discussion, which I'm really looking forward to. Um, but before we start, I'd like to acknowledge, uh, I'd like to welcome co-director of the BMC, who support the network, Professor Ian Hickey, to welcome us and do the acknowledgement. of. Uh, thank you so much, Lee Fei. So it's great to have people here at the University of Sydney and on the traditional lands of the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation, to whom we pay our respects and recognise the way in which they have learnt taken care of and learnt from each other and shared that knowledge over tens of thousands of years prior to us, people like myself washing up on boats on the shore some short time ago and thinking we have a great deal of information. Lee Face just raised a really interesting kind of set of issues. I love the co-author kind of thing. I thought the answer was going to be 10 or 12 or something of that nature because in most complex areas of multidisciplinary science, the most complex social challenges, two or three or one lab or one group, one clinical team, is not going to be sufficient. And so the Brain and Mind Centre, for those who don't know it that well, is one of the university's multidisciplinary initiatives, which seeks to respond to major external social challenges. In this case, the challenges associated with ageing in our society. Along with these other key programs in child uh, development and youth mental health, where we seek to come together to do those areas. It really does require groups of people being willing to work together it requires real leadership. You'll see all sorts of stuff around this university, leader this, leader that. It's people like Lee Fei and Sharon and Olivia and others, actually in Glendo, willing to come together across discipline. That's what it's about. And create environments in which we can come up with those things that we need to respond to. I loved uh, discussing with Jackie Troy, the Director of Indigenous Research at this university, about what mobs really do. When nearly everyone from an Anglo-Saxon background uses what I do, and occasionally what we do, but not very often, or in my world, are you okay rather than are we okay? I love to discuss two things with uh, Jackie. One's around child and youth development, taking care of people and being inclusive. The other's around ageing and the extent to which within traditional cultures, ageing is seen to bring wisdom and status and respect. Well, that's kind of interesting. In our society, subsequent to the intergenerational report, it seemed to bring costs and disability and problems to an otherwise productive world and to be a cost to the GDP of the nation. We're tied up in some of our other work in developing the mental wealth of the nation. And that's a really interesting report produced by Joel Kapinti and her colleagues uh, last year as part of our mental wealth initiative with the business school, another one of our multidisciplinary kind of activities. And we may want to guess the number of the care economy in Australia, which includes a lot of the aged care and child care. The conservative estimate of just some aspects of that care economy is $275 billion a year. That's a B, that's a billion, not me and you. And that work is done by people in settings. And of course, aged care is one of the things, but the other bit is the amount of that care that is done by older people. That in fact, rather than being a cost to the economy, they're one of the great contributors to the economy. They do a lot of the care. I was in Canberra last weekend with my own grandchildren and my six-year-old grandson took me to task about the lack of care that I was providing. <laughs> why, wasn't they, why wasn't I there more often? Six-year-olds can take this sort of stuff too. So that his mum could go to work more and do what she's doing uh, on an ongoing kind of basis, which is exactly right in those areas. Of course, in traditional cultures, there is this issue of the wisdom of intergenerational efforts and the extent to which 
intergenerational interactions are really good for the cognition of older people and for their grandkids. And the sharing of culture, the sharing of language, the sharing of experience and the problem solving sets of issues. Many older people have solved many problems in their life. The challenges that we face as a society are how do we encourage, to use uh, Sharon's and everyone else's expression, healthy brain aging. I love the healthy idea, but I might actually get healthier and not more forgetful as I get on. And certainly from a psychological point of view, that's highly likely. How do we do that? How do we support that? How do we have structures that do that? I had the pleasure of spending last Friday with the Minister for, Mental, uh, Minister for Health, Mark Butler. May, people may remember 10 years ago, he was the Minister for Mental Health and Aging. So actually, can now being the senior minister, Two of his major preoccupations are mental health, which he perceives quite rightly to be quite hard in its social context, and ageing, which he kind of likes because the federal government is the principal kind of funder in our current systems of very much having to support institutional type care, out of home type care. He's really interested in what are the future solutions, what can be done, and not just in a sense of curing something, but in fact, in providing early interventions, good assessments, information to families, supporting community supports in appropriate ways in community settings and in affordable ways and being smart about how we'll do that in the future, not how we did it in the mid 20th century. How will we do it into the 21st century? And the issues, my personal favourite, like digital innovations and other things are not things that we should think are only done by young people. How will we use those things in older people? How will we track? How do we actually increase the connectedness in our society to support older people? All of that key work requires good information into government and into the wider society. It requires groups like your own to come together to deal with issues you're dealing with, to run studies, to run proof of principle, to raise important sets of issues and feed those back into the community discourse and the public policy. So it's incredibly important for us at issues like the Brain and Mind Centre. Here at the University of Sydney, where our Vice-Chancellor uh, emphasises every day that our key responsibility is to be engaged with the society that funds us and in which we live, and to have impact, genuine impact, on those issues that are really important, not only to our own society, but are of global impact. And of course, issues related to ageing globally are recognised by all societies, including those in developing countries, as being fundamental to their futures. So we need you to do exactly what you're doing. Hopefully we can provide through the Brain and Mind Centre a degree of support for the Sydney Dementia Network and also encourage you to be articulate about that. That's, that's code word for harass us about that, hassle us about that, how well we are doing that so that we can take that up within the University of Sydney and then more broadly. Very much, I was also encouraged, I want to uh, commend Sharon Naismith and others for working with the national initiatives in this area. The Sydney Dementia Network interact with ADNET and with other groups that are running nationally. In Australia, we only have a limited number of people. We only have a limited degree of capability. And we need to work in complementary ways with others. But our own group needs to be strong and productive and multidisciplinary and ongoing. So I hope on all your publications in the future, 12 or 15 or 20 is a normal number or the right groups, not just the numbers, but the right sets of disciplines come together, including very much, I just say finally, the inclusion of people who have the experience and their families in that discussion about what are the optimal ways in which our society can take forward. The opportunities in our identification, willingness to be engaged with uh, trialling of new treatments, willingness to look at new ways of organising care on an ongoing basis so that we can seriously feed back and be engaged. And it's great to see people, Miran and Sharon and others, Lee Lo, who are prepared to engage in the public discourse about these things and to actually go out in the public and discuss with those families and those affected the nature of what is happening, but also the hopefulness about what I hope to look forward to, which is healthy brain aging. Thank you. Thank you, Ian. Goodbye, Ian. Um, I'm Olivier Piguet, I'm chairing the this first session, and I've got the great pleasure to introduce Amy Brockman uh, as the first speaker. I've known Amy, we've known each other for about 15 years now. Yeah, yeah. Um, and uh, collaborating on and off over this time. Uh, for people who don't know Amy, she was for a number of years at the Flora Institute and University of Melbourne before being poached or decided to move to Monash University. Um, where she's leading, I can't remember your title, Head of Cognitive Health Initiative. Um, so focusing primarily on vascular determinant of brain health. 
But Amy also founded one of the first, or if not the first, uh, cognitive neurology clinic in Australia, in Melbourne, with a fabulous acronym, ECDC, um, Eastern Cognitive Dementia Neuro uh, Neurology yeah, Disorders. Um, and um, yeah, and been working not only on vascular dementia and, and vascular health, but also on frontotemporal dementia over all these years. And she's going to tell us about emerging concepts in vascular cognitive impairment and dementia. Welcome, Amy. Thank you, Olivia. Thanks very much um, for the invitation to talk to the City Dementia Network. Thanks again. I can just up and down on the arrows. Yeah, yeah thanks. Um, uh, many people here I know, and I feel very grateful to have been invited. Thank you very much to Lee Fay, and thank you very much to Shannon for a superbly organised event, I think, and well done. You, you'd be surprised how hard it is to get a Melbourneian to Sydney and back again the day I'm still not back, so we'll wait and see how, how it goes, but thank you very much. So. I've been asked to talk on um, emerging concepts in vascular cognitive impairment, and I really wanted to give you an idea that this is complex. So before I start, I, I want to also acknowledge um, the fact that all of the work that, that I'm talking about from my group, from my lab, and from my amazing collaborators, which there are many, um, was done on the lands of the Wurundjeri, Woiwurrung people of the Kulin Nation. I acknowledge the elders, um, past, present, and emerging, and any First Nations people viewing this presentation. Um, so to talk about what what is vascular cognitive impairment would take all day. It's my pet topic. I won't do that, I promise. And I've already asked Olivia to give me a shout out when I'm going over time. I believe that vascular contributions to late life cognitive impairment are the most important co contributions. And certainly globally, they probably are the most important contributions and they're treatable. So we've known this for decades, a very long time. So I'm gonna just give some of the background on that, some of the peak findings from the really extraordinary epidemiological and brain ban banking studies that have been done globally. And then also talk a little bit about Canvas, a study that we've been doing and some work that was done um, with other groups and mine for my dementia uh, research team grant. And I'm just gonna let you know that this concept of vascular cognitive impairment, post-stroke cognitive impairment, it's, it's changing. It's no longer regarded as this thing that only happens to some people after multiple strokes. It just doesn't, it just doesn't work like that. And if I've got time, um, I will talk about new therapeutics because there's a lot there. So I'm going to digress, and I like to digress because it is Ockham versus Hickam, and the fact is life gives us Hickam. Now, if people don't know, and this is actually part of the uh, medical student nomenclature, we talk about, talk about Ockham's razor, the philosophical concept that one disease causes all of the manifestations. So patients present with one syndrome, we have to put it all together to make a single diagnosis. But Hickam said a person can have as many pathologies as he damn well pleases. And so um, I think life gives us hickam. So pre previously, vascular cognitive impairment was not classified as degenerative. I remember the, one of the first grants that I wrote about this saying, is, saying, actually calling it, is stroke neurodegenerative. Some of the reviewers were very unhappy about that. Um, and it's because there's been, in the last four or five decades, there's been this concept that toxic brain protein must be causing the degeneration. So there's this been tying together of these two ideas, toxic brain proteins being deposited in the brain, causing neurodegeneration. Now, neurodefinitions are actually changing that, and we've now got this idea that neurodegenerative disease is caused when there's progressive loss of brain neurons and synaptic dysfunction from whatever cause. Because we've known also for decades that MS is neurodegenerative and people haven't kind of got too um, funny about that. Um, so I think that we know that oxidative stress, neuroinflammation, all of these things can actually cause neurodegeneration. You don't have to have a single protein that's, that's poisoning the neurons. And this has also come from a lot of the epidemiological data because we've also known that the strongest risk factors for all-cause dementia, for Alzheimer's dementia, and uh, for vascular dementia, obviously, are cardiovascular risk factors. And they sh they're the same. 
Globally, the strongest risk factor for all dementias, including Alzheimer's disease, is hypertension. So we were talking before about, you know, primary healthcare networks and primary practitioners. GPs are doing the greatest experiment at the moment right now by treating people with hypertension. It is the strongest vascular risk factor and it's also the strongest risk factor for Alzheimer's globally. I'd be really interested to hear uh, to hear Jamie's uh, conversations because certainly when I visit colleagues in in Malaysia and Thailand and, and southern India, they're not interested in talking about Alzheimer's. They just want to talk about this. And we also know that hypertension can actually cause manifestations that we are we associate with vascular cognitive impairment, slowed speed of processing, and executive impairments that are classical impairments of VCI and post-stroke cognitive impairment, we can see those with subtle, with tests that pick up subtle dysfunction in non-demented people, even after two to five years of hypertension. So if it's not treated, we start to see these manifestations. So it's exerting, these risk factors are exerting these effects on the brains that we can only pick up. So that is a slow, subtle progression. We know, and if I, if, if I get time, that these effects can certainly be mediated by exercise and diet. It's really important. And we also know from some of the big um, hypertension studies, progress and mind, sprint mind, again, in a, in a dementia audience, people haven't always heard of these. These were pivotal studies for post-stroke and also for hypertension. So the hypertensionologists, uh, uh, these are huge studies. We know that treatment can reduce your risk of dementia. And there was a fabulous study that was uh, published last year done on a village by village treatment basis in, in China. So primary prevention that also demonstrated this. So we know about vascular risk and there's also some epidemiological evidence that not prevalence, but dementia incidence in high income countries, not in low income countries, but high and some middle income countries is declining. And this has largely been postulated because we're actually treating cardiovascular risk. So cardiovascular disease is declining and incidence, again, not prevalence. Remember, we have an ageing world. So prevalence is skyrocketing. There's no doubt that this is a problem. Um, and there's also some sex and dementia syndrome specific risks that are emerging, which is really fascinating because whilst we, there's a lot of work that's being done on why more women get Alzheimer's disease, more men get vascular disease, we haven't really understood it. When we look at the actual risk in an individual, it appears that your risk if cardiovascular disease or cardiovascular risk factors, if you're a woman, you're more likely to increase your risk of Alzheimer's. But if you're a man, you're more likely to increase your risk of vascular dementia. And we don't fully understand that, but these differential risks are only just emerging. We probably don't fully understand it because we haven't fully looked at it. And that's a whole nother discussion. So we get then to the, the brain banking studies that really, for me, were pivotal in my thinking about vascular cognitive impairment. And, and this is the religious order studies that has now merged with the Rush Memory and Aging Project. Chicago-based, um, uh, which was the uh, University of Illinois, other side of the river for me when I was in, um, in Chicago. Um, and they, this has been an amazing project. Um, where initially nuns and then priests and brothers agreed to come in for a neuropsych evaluation and a medical assessment, and now they come in for an MRI as well and bloods, um, and um, uh, then they'd agreed that they could donate their brain after their death because they didn't need it. God didn't need it anymore, so they could give it to us. And what came from that is that these were people who were followed longitudinally, obviously these were people who weren't presenting with a stroke or with cog you know, cognitive impairment necessarily. But these were community dwelling people and amyloid status bore very little correlation with their cognitive profile during life. So they could have none or tons, it didn't seem to correlate with their cognition. What did correlate was their number of strokes and vascular disease in their brain. And this was especially for women who had, uh, women who got dementia when they had small vessel disease and microvascular disease. And they were all characterised very beautifully in this study, and they still are in the Rush Memory and Ageing study. And this was then borne out in a lot of the longitudinal series that have come out, these marvellous cohort studies, the, the Baltimore study of ageing, the Framingham that many of you would have heard of, um, the, uh, and, and also the English longitudinal study of ageing that I'll talk about in a moment. 
So the thing I love about this study is that this was, again, looking at ageing, normal ageing, healthy ageing, and trying to work out what happened to you at the end of your life. Were there risk factors? Were you more likely to get dementia or cognitive impairment? So the ELSA study published this about five years ago now. So there's just over 90, just under 9,300 people who were recruited, no dementia or stroke at the start. They were about 63 years and there was actually more women than men. One of the first studies to do that, the same is true of the UK Brain Bank, which is interesting. Most studies recruit more men than women. They had under 500, just under 500 strokes over that time. And not surprisingly, those people who had a stroke showed a decline in their global cognition after the stroke, but they were declining before they had their stroke. So those people who then went on to develop a stroke actually had decline in global cognition, memory, semantic fluency, and temporal orientation before the stroke, almost as if the stroke is a risk factor for cognitive decline and cognitive decline is a risk factor for stroke. This suggests that these accumulations were occurring prior to any incident stroke. It's just the tip of the iceberg. 10% of people over the age of 70, I'm a stroke neurologist, 10% of people over the age of 70 have got silent infarcts. We don't know about it. Cognitively, they never know. Um, or, and clinically, they don't know. This stroke that brought them into hospital is just the tip of the iceberg in terms of the vascular disease. So authors have said it's an initiator, stimulator, a contributor to neurodegeneration. The problem has been is that stroke in patients that at least 10%, in fact, it's higher now, have got a history of cognitive decline or dementia. Around a third have a history of dementia or cognitive decline three to five years afterwards. And the other big issue, and again from the NUN study, my, my favourite studies, um, is that co-pathologies are the norm. So this is where we get Ockham versus Hickam. And Hickam wins on this occasion. You don't just die with one pathology in the brain. You don't just have amyloid and tau being one pathology in terms of Alzheimer's. When they looked at more than 1,000 people who died who'd been followed, mixed pathology was ubiquitous. Most people had um, more than one, so 95% had more than one pathology. One pathology includes Alzheimer's pathology being amyloid and tau. 80% had more than two, 60% had more than three. So mixed pathologies are the norm. And if we get to it in the panel, this is one of the big issues with this concept of one treatment, one MAB that's going to rule the world. It's a bit Lord of the Rings, actually. Um, but it's not, it's not gonna, you know, it's not gonna solve most of the pathology. And in lower income countries in the global south, they're saying this is just not gonna work. One, it's too expensive. And also, what about the people with these other diseases? So AD pathology accounted for about 50% of cognitive loss, but a lot of the other pathologies were infarcts and CAA, which is a small vessel disease, athero and arteriolosclerosis, and or Lewy bodies are huge. Lots of people, in fact, they're almost ubiquitously co-pathologies with Alzheimer's disease. I regard them. Hippocampal sclerosis was, uh, was very common, which we now recognise as late. I don't think Glenda Halliday's in the audience, but this concept of this limbic predominant TDP 43opathy that's probably contributing the most to late life amnestic um, issues rather than Alzheimer's AD, if you like. So all these pathologies are manifesting and these pathologies we can see, we can either see on MRI scans or we can see under the microscope. And this is, a, I've got a couple of slides from a paper I did with my uh, friend and colleague, Natalia Rost, that was um, in circulation research two years ago. So we can see all these pathologies under the microscope, but what about neuroinformation? I don't see pathological reports that say this patient had X amount of activated microglia. We don't see it. We don't look for it. It's not actually reported. If someone dies with a brain abscess, it's reported. If someone dies straight after their acute infarct, massive microglial activation, both phagocytic and also activation. We don't know what they're doing, but it's just not reported. So there are silent pathologies that aren't actually being considered here. Neuroinflammation is a major contributor to all-cause dementia, not just vascular cognitive impairment, which it certainly is, but certainly in Alzheimer's disease. And there's a lot of uh, treatments. Um, uh, Michael Woodward was at ADPD last year, last week, and he was speaking a lot about the new treatments for neuroinflammation. We did a series of projects for the, my Dementia de Research Team grant where colleagues, uh, Charlotte Amain and Vanessa um, 
Great. Looked at, uh, at animals that were stroked and then kept alive and then uh, over they were kept alive for six weeks, 12 weeks, 24 weeks, etc. Tiny strokes, all recovered, couldn't tell the difference between the sham animal and the animal that had had the stroke. The animals that had a stroke had enduring microglial activation until the last sacrifice point, which was 48 weeks afterwards. So a year, but basically we kept them alive. They still had ongoing neuroinflammation. So stroke is setting up persistent pervasive neuroinflammation. We can't see that in humans because we don't yet have a good marker. And the other big issue, I think, is this concept that we've had a very hypothesis-driven conceptualization of neurodegenerative diseases. You know, we've got the amyloid hypothesis, the tau hypothesis, the neuroinflammation. If we step back and, you know, AI and, and large computing initiatives allow us to do this, if we get a more data-driven approach, we can actually get some insights into uh, what might be happening. A paper that was just published last month in, in Nature Aging from the UK Biobank, thousands of papers from that. Plasma study, again, these people must have given a bucket of blood because there's so many plasma studies out there. They must be completely in, um, bloodless when they leave. Um, there was 1,400 people who developed dementia over 14 years of follow-up in the UK data at Brain Bank. You would have seen that um, uh, all of these people um, uh, give blood and there have been literally hundreds of studies looking at tau and amyloid, seeing when they rise before the dementia diagnosis. This group just said, let's look at all the plasma proteins we can measure, which is their O-Link platform, 1,400 proteins. And the ones that came out that most predicted all-cause dementia, vascular dementia and Alzheimer's disease were not tau and not amyloid, but glyophobiliary acidic protein, GFAP or GFAP, um, neuro, neurofilament light chain, not surprisingly, a non-specific marker of neurodegeneration. And then two proteins, GDF15 and LTBP2, which are markers of liver, renal and heart disease and chronic neuroinflammation, in fact, of other inflammatory disease. They were the ones that were most strongly associated using a data-driven approach. So I think we need to flip things around in our thinking. Lots of pathologies are going to be contributing to late life cognitive impairment, not just the stroke. But even within the stroke, there's so much going on. You've got people who actually could be having micro infarcts, they could be having bleeds, they could be having genetic modifiable and non-modifiable risk factors. The brain is a complex space. And if we live to our 70s and 80s, even our 60s, we often have acquired life and we've acquired um, some brain pathologies that aren't just one. So we wanted to look at this in a study that I um, that is now more than 10 years old, um, the CANVAS study, which is cognition and neocortical volume after stroke. These were looking at a, recruiting a group of adult stroke patients who didn't have a history of, of stroke of dementia, sorry, beforehand to try to pull out that you know co-varying pathology. They only had ischemic strokes. The, the hemorrhagic stroke is a different story, still problematic, but we only chose ischemic stroke patients. We very closely phenotyped these people and looked at them within six weeks of their stroke, median about three weeks, three months, one year, three years, and five years for those people who are still available to come in. We did APOE genotyping as well, and we did physical activity markers to see how they, active they were. We could derive some sleep metrics from that. We did a, 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 a broad but fairly uncomplicated neuropsychological assessment. With We grouped these into five domains. We used the Hopkins because we wanted to have something that was a bit easier for our stroke patients. Um, we had some tests of executive and obviously quite heavy on attention function as well. And I used the, the Boston naming test for language, which I would not do again, but that's fine. What do we find? We found that at the time of the stroke, brain volume was already compromised. And if you think of that ELSA study, where they were already declining, that's probably not surprising. We looked at hippocampal volume and total brain volume, and we found that those people who had, had had a stroke had lower hippocampal volumes than um, those people. These are our controls. These are our strokes. These are our patients with recurrent stroke. 
So you can see our controls had much larger hippocampal volumes than our first ever strokes and our recurrent stroke patients. And if you look at our strokes put together, those in red are recurrent, and you can see that they had smaller hippocampal volumes, smaller hippocampi than the, than, the, than the median of the stroke group overall. So this suggests almost a dose-dependent effect. You know, the risk factors are bad, they're compromising, but the stroke is also causing more impacts. Um, and this created quite a splash when it was published because it really kind of had upset that concept that there was just, you know, the stroke set off everything anew that on, a, on this virgin brain, which was clearly not true. The next thing we wanted to do was to say, okay, what happens after the stroke? Is a particular area is more vulnerable? And also, are there times when we're losing a lot of brain volume that we could intervene? This concept of, you know, windows for intervention, which is huge in cardiovascular disease and in stroke, but less so in, in dementia, I suppose, because we're always thinking it's this long continuum that's not speeding up or slowing down. That's probably not entirely true. Certainly not in some of the frontotemporal dementias. That's probably not true. And what we found is that, um, so these, all of the top bars on these simple line graphs are our control participants. You can see we've got hemispheric brain volume, total brain volume, thalamic volume and hippocampal um, volume. And we divided the volumes to ipsy and contralesional for the stroke patients, because it is often a unilateral event. And this is our hippocampal volumes declining over the first 90 days and continuing to decline. But look what's happening to the thalami. The, thalami, the thalamus on the side of the lesion is disappearing. The thalami are our central hub, our plug-in for all of our cognitive processing in the brain. And that volume loss is especially noticeable in that first three months. So if we're gonna intervene, we need to intervene in that time. So we've got actually a potential time window to do something with drugs or with behavioural therapies to try to stop that from happening. We looked at white matter and we are using a fixal based approach, which is a another way of looking at um, uh, brain volume loss, but actually looking at specific the, specifically the white matter. Natalia Egorova, who was a postdoc in my group, then looked at this about in, uh, in 2020 we found very significant white matter loss as well. These people are disconnected. Their white matter is atrophying. At three years, we had slightly less numbers, but again, we found that those people who had a stroke had lost brain volume at a much greater rate. So this is total brain volume change. So the more brain volume loss is, the wor is, is worse um, over the time. And those people who were cognitively impaired at three months after stroke lost the most volume. So there's an association with impairment and with their brain volume loss. We wanted to look at cortical thinning or cortical thickness, because this is an area of a lot of interest. So in dementia, in the dementias, frontotemporal dementia um, and in Alzheimer's disease, and less so in some of the other dementias, there's really classical imaging signatures that, you know, certain areas like biparietal loss for Alzheimer's disease and anterior temporal loss for the for semantic dementia, et cetera, et cetera. This hasn't been described in vascular cognitive impairment, probably because obviously a stroke will cause thinning and damage to an area. So it's very heterogeneous. So we thought we'd look at three years to see whether there was a cortical thinning pattern across the groups. And, um, we, we then ran into the problem of the fact that cortical thinning and healthy ageing actually exhibits asymmetry. Now, this is, we should have a meeting on this alone. This is fascinating. There's actually an Enigma laterality working group working on this. Our brains actually develop asymmetrically. So our right hemisphere develops earlier, has thicker cortex earlier and then thins less over our life than our left hemisphere. I mean, that is interesting because it may explain some of the potential vulnerability underlying the primary progressive aphasias, why we develop those aphasias, because the, the left hemisphere thins less. And in fact, the, the concept is of retrogenesis, is a recapitulation in reverse of what happens to the to um, in brain maturation. So we wanted to see whether we were seeing an acceleration of that in, in our patients, you know, an increase in their thinning. 
In our canvas controls, we saw what we expected. We saw more thinning of the left hemisphere than the right, um, which is uh, expected, but they were in all the areas. So our canvas controls thinned just as we expected. Our stroke patients thinned more on the right than the left, but they had more right hemispheric strokes. So we're not sure what to think to, to make of that. What was interesting is that there was actually a big effect of APOE in this group. Now, most of you think of APOE4 as that strong genetic risk factor, the most uh, significant genetic risk factor for Alzheimer's disease, but it was actually described as a cardiovascular risk factor. And what we found is that patients who, had APO, who were APOE4 allele carriers had a, quite a unique pattern where they had a lot of ACC, anterior cingulate thinning, left and right, but more on the left, interestingly, than people who were not carriers. Now, the ACC is really important for speed of processing, motivation, drive, executive functions, all the things we associate with vascular cognitive impairment. And again, we saw the thinning. So I'm going to probably just speed through the last little bit, but I think this slide is my thinking in the sense that the risk factors cause this smoldering little fire in our brain that's having ongoing changes, that all of the risk factors for stroke, for cardiovascular disease cause this smoldering fire. If we have a stroke, we have this massive in increase in neuroinflammation that really burns the house down, where we really get that really you saw that thalamic loss, which is very significant. I think that the, the, might help to explain some of this long-standing as well as acute events pathology. So I only have a couple more minutes. I won't go into current therapies, except to say, I think we understand the vascular drivers of late life cognitive impairment now. We need better biomarkers, just as we're moving into better biomarkers for Alzheimer's, quite controversial ones, but better ones. We need to really be able to stratify risk. We need to intervene with brain health optimization, including exercise, and we're actually doing a study on that right now. And we also need to develop disease-specific prescriptions for our patients. And that's why I think that the field is going. So I will leave there so I can have some questions. <laughs> Fabulous, Amy. Thank you. So we have time for questions, Amy. Fuzzy. My understanding was so the actual intervention done is targeting vascular risk factors. The evidence is mixed, and I'm assuming it's because it's so hard to do, and you've got to do it over longer duration. <laughs> So you actually put it all together. If you put it all together, you're quite right, but certainly blood pressure control is there's there's really class one evidence for that now. So sprint, sprint mind, progress, the infinity trial, and then the the, the study that was that's done, um, two studies that were done last year that showed statins definitely mixed, absolutely antiplatelets, no evidence. So just for blood pressure control and DOAX, no evidence as well. I think it is both, but I think it's a biological problem. I think that, you know, there's, there's, there's good evidence now that statins don't do harms to the, to the brain in terms of cognition, but I think that it is very complicated. And I also think that maybe the targets need to change. So I did um, talk a little bit about emerging therapies, and there's a huge amount of work being done on phosphodiesterase inhibitors now. So there's a number of classes. There's PD-1, 3, and 5 um, inhibitors, um, which uh, there's good Again, there's some epidemiological evidence that men who take these have a lower incidence of dementia. Now, that it may be a little co confounded. We won't go into that. But the, they've actually done some studies on psilostazole um, and uh, Joanna Wardlaw has done a study looking at vascular cognitive impairment. There's a number of studies being done at the moment looking at psil, um, denophil as well. So maybe we need to be thinking more broadly about what targets...
you're right that we need better markers for uh, inflammation. Um, uh, we've obviously got the astrocyte um, GFAT, but um, with microglia, we're, we're fairly poor. In the conference in Lisbon, they were talking about TREM2 as a good marker of microglial activation. Mm. It's now measurable even in plasma. Um, do you think that's going to be a resilient biomarker for microglial activation? Yeah, I think so. I mean, I think that we're, we're getting better. We've got better PET um, microglia, uh, the, those, those third generation TSOPs. In fact, there's there's a couple that are coming out now that are really good. I think TREM2 is pretty good. I mean, you know, 10 years ago, I was speaking to, to John Hodges about measuring progranulin in the blood and we couldn't, there's no way we could do it. And now we can, you know, these the advances in, in the Samoa technologies and platforms and in proteomics, large scale proteomics. I think so. It's, we really need to understand for whom and how. And that problem is, is doing those studies is very, very difficult. We're doing a study looking at the real world utility of neurofilament light chain. Any patient with a cognitive complaint coming to a healthcare network, any patient. And it's just, you know, it's very different um, than the studies presented by the Mayo Clinic and by, by Harvard, you know, the, the Hickam rules. And so the world is a complex place. I mean, that was a great over. Thank you very much. Very interesting. Um, just on the concept of biomarkers, is coming back to what you were saying that we need better biomarkers. All these blood biomarkers are very specific, right? So they don't actually give you anything about the location and the spread of the mm -hmm. damage. So coming into the new imaging field, which is what I'm interested in, is there any scope for investigating uh, markers of blood flow, for example, that, mm -hmm. you know, and addressing directly the link between the heart and the vascular system and the brain? And having to, you know, try to sort of like get a bit early into the disease process before the neurodegeneration actually happens. Even though you're talking about white matter, you know, when the white matter degenerates, it's already too late. But it's kind of like getting to a point a bit later there. So sort of like trying to get a bit one step behind and addressing that by establishing markers of blood flow that might be directly related to vascular risk. Yeah. So, I mean, we've, uh, it, these studies are really hard to do. Um, uh, we are doing, there's a MR Casper study that we're doing where we're looking at um, uh, actually using colchicine and anti-inflammatory after stroke to improve post-stroke outcomes as well as hopefully prevent uh, post-stroke dementia. Um, so we're taking bloods on those people. There's a lot of studies that have shown that been looking after stroke, but who do you pick to look at blood flow and then how do you measure it and what, I mean, you know, better than anyone here that, you know, measuring cerebral blood flow via the markers that we've had, particularly non-invasive ones, um, is incredibly difficult. So what is the actual gold standard? Um, there is some work, in fact, the, from in the stroke literature, um, there's some work done in hemorrhagic stroke that appears that there's some, they're mainly clotting biomarkers though, um, in the acute ischemic stroke, it's inflammation. Unfortunately, in the interest of time, we'll have to Thank stop you. here. Thank you again. Thank you. All right, now it's my pleasure to introduce Jaime Miranda. Uh, Jaime is head of school here at Sydney University School of Public Health, and Jaime trained in Peru and then um, in London and has multiple appointments around the world, including Boston, as well as London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine. Um, he's going to tell us something that is extremely important in, in uh, health and medicine is how do we deal about global inequity and access to uh, uh, prevention and treatment, and uh, looking at um, well, less lessons from the low and middle income countries. Thank you, Jaime. Good afternoon, everybody. <clears throat> Buenas tardes. Um, I'm gonna start say how jealous I am because in a space like this doesn't exist in my country. So you're ahead of the game. I'm going to also ask my two colleagues from Peru uh, to stand up. We have Jorge and Carlos. Uh, they're coming from the University of Chachapoyas. We sit in the middle of the Amazon. 
So thank you for being with us. And they want to learn also what's happening here in Sydney. The first disclosure I will make is I never treated a patient with dementia. And the second one is I'm getting old now. I never saw a patient with dementia in my medical training. Now I say that not to say that I have not lived with people with dementia. I have seen it on the other side of the equation. But I have to be upfront with you because when you travel to million, low million countries, you may have people like me with that, that kind of background and training. And all of this is, obviously we read it, you publish, we see it, but we need to put in context what does it mean for us. And I finished my medical training at year 2000, we're hitting, oh my God, 25 years, big celebration next year. Um, and ironically, for me, choosing my research to focus on chronic conditions was largely because what I was seeing on the bed was not what the New England Journal of Medicine was publishing. I was reading a lot of the literature publishing on myocardial infractions and, you know, the time, the golden hour, get a thrombolysis. What I was seeing was this on my bed where people with a strokes at age 40 and their family destroys. And that kind of had a strong influence of who I am and what I do. Certainly I have to thank every one of you, particularly those in Latin America who confronted and were on the front lines of the COVID pandemic. Every single Peruvian must know at least 50 people by name who died during the pandemic. So we were heavily, heavily hit. A bit of a side talk, but to come, most of my work tries to connect with what matters for society. And more recently, I've been working with a large UN team of scientists of how do we drive what's left of the seven years to the 2030 Sustainable Development Goals Agenda. I invite you to check on this group because it's in a way is to foster spaces like this, like this one where multidisciplinarity is not only the way or the nice thing to do, but it's the must thing to do. We need to embrace into transformations towards accelerate for change. Business as usual won't do good for the planet and we as scientists have responsibilities. Acknowledging that I'm new to the country, I'm new to the institution, I'm new to the role, I'm new to the school. I have, um, I'm the new, I'm the Paddington Bear, right? So the new Peruvian in town, coming from Darkest Peru. And actually Darkest Peru is where they're from. Uh, and, um, but this is the group that I was working with, the Chronica Center of Excellence in Chronic Diseases. Um, and what can sustain research and high quality research in a country where funded is not priority? Scientific research is not a career option and we want to be part of the conversation internationally. Generosity was top of our list, not because it's the first letter on the, how do you say, abecedario, IBCDC, but it matters a lot to that. We have to be generous with our science and how we treat our colleagues and people. Definitely innovation and quality if you want to be part of this community, which is science. And back in the region, integrity is a very important word for us. You might have heard all the stories of corruption and difficult lives that happen in the, in the region. I celebrated what I'm here a little bit, and I am grateful for Amy who paved a nice way as for me to, to, to do this presentation. And um, um, in that publication about, the, about uh, this previous one, addressing the, assessing the present and prevention in the future, it was an invitation from colleagues in the region, acknowledging their difficulties and the challenges and how to we do this things differently, and they want to promote particip participatory culture. And prevention and prevention research are important topics that our side are not necessarily the most attractive things on the specialist field. Back in 2009, and uh, there was concern that proposed local investigators are quite junior, but that's the reality that you're gonna face when you try to engage with those particular colleagues and the skills. And uh, the work that I was doing, um, in a way, caught the attention of the world, but not of our group. We were busy, 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 writing, surviving, and doing things, and being generous. 
uh, it was very, very reassuring to see that nature kind of was able to portray us as a model of interdisciplinary research that is scarce in any part of the world. So kudos to my team. And I suppose part of the success is having these interactions with multiple professionals throughout, which are not new for you guys, but uh, in context of scarcity, running an idea through all these different fields and making sure that we're on the same page, aiming towards the same goal and connected and engaged towards the same target means a lot. So part of my success that I tell my junior colleagues is that if you are able for every single one of your colleagues to elaborate in two sentences your grant, assuming that these are very colleagues that come from different disciplines, you have a chance, you have a chance of getting it funded. I like this picture, it's not for me, I borrow it from the internet, but this reassuring that working in teams is really hard. And I have to remind that at this space we're real, we make mistakes, we say I'm sorry. Not everything is nice as the pictures that I have here. One important part of my, that drives my, my career and my motivation is prevention. And um, I use this slide a lot as an invitation for us to reflect on the power of changing societies. And Jeffrey Ross asked this important question. He said, the most important question is why Kenyans, and you have the, the dotted lines are Kenyans, and the solid line is uh, civil servants in the UK. And these are distributions of systolic blood pressure. And why is it different? And um, part of the answer, you can say, oh, we're comparing apples with oranges. No, 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 the point being is, it's a visual explanation of the determinants of the population mean. And he says, for what distinguishes the two groups is nothing to do with the characteristics of individuals. It is rather a shift of the whole distribution. So if you have any ideas about shifting the whole distribution, certain populations will become more aging. Risk factors will be established, but if we move the needle across the population, we will have an important impact. I'm glad that Amy presented this for me and, and you beautifully. Most of these factors, the risk factors for dementia are shared risk factors across multiple conditions. And, and 30% of them can explain that. However, in Latin America, the percentage increases to 56% due to a combination of cultural, political, and economic factors, among others. So perhaps reaching out to you guys to say we have existence vessels of communications, interest, and mutual priorities, such as let's continue working together. This is a group that I uh, that was led by a Colombian uh, colleague doing uh, some uh, playing with machine learning data analytics and comparing um, the to how much the traditional risk factors versus social risk factors will explain brain health. And it was salient to see that poverty and uh, education was one of the strongest predictors of cognitive decline in, in, in the Latin American setting, in addition to the ones we know. So the mention doesn't occur in isolation. Let me run through this. And, uh, and I'm a very visual person. And uh, most of the stories that we use in our technical jargon is why, why Latin America matches? I mean, we don't have billions of populations in many other countries. Yet Latin America has survived or has gone through this very unique natural experiment, which is urbanization has happened rapidly, swiftly, massively in a very short period of time. 80% of the population in Latin America now lives in urban settings. 50 years ago, it was less than 40%. So that is a very dramatic, rapid, large shift. The other thing that you might hear from Latin America is that the Spanish did a very good job in terms of putting nice buildings with us. This is not Sevilla. This is the main squares in Lima. But if you are go to the top of the hill and you look behind that, that's the reality of, of many Latin American cities. Large inequalities, profound urban dispossession and economic challenges. And I suppose that comes in the international language. But what do you see when, I, when we talk about Latin America? What's my personal experience? I want you, I've done this exercise in Latin America quite a bit. I think I'm gonna do it again here. Maybe some of you already saw the trick. And a bit of, uh, as a bit of a stretching legs, I'm gonna invite you, all of you to stand up, please. So that you don't fall asleep. Thank you very much. We're gonna put our hands 
next to our shoulder or whatever of the height of our mothers. So my mom was this tall. I'm very keen to see Olivia's mom. Oh, there you go. And then let's go to the grandma side. The grandma, my grandma was here. Wow, you have an outlier here that went in the other direction. Thank you for that. The message is that even within two generations, we've seen massive and large transformations. Have a seat. Thank you for that. The question there is, if that gaining height or this field like you, you would have said, we would like to see that gain in height in more cells. You would love to see more brain cells. But what I see in my career is that we've gotten taller populations, but equally fatter populations. I wish we could have made that gain towards more healthy type of cell, but not necessarily. And that is the challenge. And that's another biological, very rapid, dramatic switch in our populations in front of our noses. The line in orange here is not me. It's year 2000. 30% of chronic undernutrition. If we project that line back into my generation, it was 50%. So one in two of my peers will have experience and will be living today with the penalties of that early exposure to chronic undernutrition. One in two. And that's the current workforce that we have, and that's the current patient load or type or profile of people that will be coming into our health systems. I'm not that old yet. Even in Tanzania, we're seeing those changes. So what does it mean? Those penalties that are inflicted early in lifehood, in lifetime, are not that, okay, you got cured by pneumonia, and then off you go, or you had malaria, off you go. But if you have chronic undernutrition, your body, in a way, sets paths to adapt and to live into that environment. I use this example of, everybody's full of cars now, right? And if we all have the genetic capability, which also our DNA is very similar, if we all have the potential to be tall and healthy, imagine what it is growing in the Amazon where my colleagues are from. In the first year of life, you're investing your energy into pneumonia, you're investing your energy into food scarcity, you're investing your energy into how to survive uh, malaria, et cetera, et cetera. You don't have energy left for that body to grow healthily. So it's that deficit that has this penalty throughout the life. And I think we often ignore that, the power of that. And let me give you a visual, a visual example. I'm glad the first time in my career that someone is gonna understand this picture. I don't need to ask you what is this, I hope. And those are my peers. These are pictures of neurons and neuron synapses of children who have experienced chronic undernutrition and people who have not. And I won't tell you what it means because you know and you study it and you live with it. You know more than I do. What I want to tell you is that in the same way that the brain has been affected with that very critical period of life at year one, imagine the other organs. Imagine that type of engine that we bring to the world these organs are going to fail earlier. These are going to be challenged, are going to be loaded, are going to be constrained, are, going to, are not going to perform. And we tend to overlook this a lot. If this is the price of the stunted brains, imagine what, what we physically see is stunted kids that we have documented stunted brains. So what does it mean for the other organs? A point of reflection that all these gains that we see on societal levels, I gave the example of height. These are not gains for life. And reverses occur, and this is what right now is happening in the UK. Some of you may be much more closer to that reality. The UK children now are becoming the tallest, no, pardon, the smallest or shortest within the OECD communities, despite all the gains that they have in previous years and decades. If these kids in the UK are becoming shorter, imagine the penalties that are going to pay in the future as well. So that's me, where I come from. Still nothing to do with dementia, but I hope it's making the contact. Now, what do we do about it? And I want to make the pause. And I want you to make this emphasis. And again, I'm a very visual person. When you talk about the health system, 
I don't know what you have in your mind. When I hear what is the health system, this is what I have in my mind. My starting point being, perhaps we're at different points of conversation. We're not communicating. And when I hear you guys, let's do this and let's do that and let's add this, oh, maybe you can do that. I feel that we're thinking about putting the air conditioner and the hammock in this building. So please, please, whenever you're gonna have this conversation, make sure that you equalize what you have an idea because I hear I've been amazed and surprised to see. Example number one, we are the zip code with the lowest mortality due to COVID in the planet. And you tell you my slide number one, I know 50 people that are from the pandemic. We're not talking about the same things. Make sure you equalize and make sure there is capacity to say that can we progress things further. I wish it's a very good South American football runs through our brain, uh, our brain, sorry, our veins. I would say our brains as well. Um, and I wish this was a World Cup tally. Number one, Peru. Number two, Ecuador. Bolivia, Mexico. Okay, it's paid for Armenia, man. Colombia, blah, blah, blah. Um, pardon, no, but, but Paraguay, Guatemala, Brazil. So out of its 25th largest position, you have a number of South American countries. This is where this ranking in the table because usually Latin America doesn't make it on the top except for excess mortality during COVID. So it has been a very challenging, challenging, challenging and uh, circumstances and a telling story of the capacity, the readiness and the challenges of health systems. <clears throat> this is a picture during the pandemic and this is the corridors of a jungle hospital where I did part of my medical internship. Three days after arrival, I say, hi, man, Popeye, give us a visit to the ICU. And the guy left on holidays. So he left me as a medical student in charge of it. We have a problem of capacity resources, but also when pains are pressed to the maximum, people are being treated on the corridors. So you can have your guidelines, you can have your markers, you can have your specimens. We were facing many other, other challenges. Okay, now let's try to bring in our closest. So with all channels now, my starting point to research, if you ever approach to me is, oh, Jaime has that picture of what is a health system, right? So if you come with your air conditioner, I'm gonna tell you I need a hammock. What does it mean for us? First slide, hypertension. I use this slide a lot with my colleagues because, oh, hypertension is a problem of the rich world. No, guys, you say, but even in the rich world, and this is a study of the UK, New cases of hypertension, individuals initiated treatment, treatment. Within one year, you see how the treatment adherence declined. And the point of me for using this slide is we're talking about that you came at, you, at, we're talking about you, a health system in the UK, one of the most powerful or robust ones. We can get into conversation, it's not the same, but I come from Peru. You have to. One of the most robust ones, you have a GP practitioner network, you have access to medicine, they are free at the point of contact, you have a, et cetera. And still halfway through the year one, people are not taking the medication. So imagine the virus that we will have to encounter. Let me give another example of diabetes. We use the data, we use time of studies data and to see how much time people will allocate to get a label of diabetes, which means in practice, go to the hospital, get a blood test, be seen by a specialist, or not even a specialist, somebody else, get the results back, read the number, and say yes, no, it's diabetes. Well, it amounted to, to the total of four days of not working, because you have to wake up at 4 a.m., pay your, for your medical record, make an appointment for the lab, make an appointment for the, lab, for the doctor, who will send you to make an appointment for the lab, then you have to go and pick up yourself your results. Then you have to come back and then take the results to the doctor, et cetera. Those number of encounters equates to four days of work. If you are on a very minimum salary, which is less than $200, can you afford four days of, of work? No, you can't. And then even if, sorry, it looks like I'm a politician now. You got me excited, sorry. It's the first time that I, I'm talking to people like you guys, thank you. Um, I don't think if you have time, if you are able to break those obstacles of access, price, distance, time, I love this study because we stood up, we stood out of the cardiologist, uh, oh my God, five minutes, okay, hold on a second. 
we stood out of the cardiologist uh, clinic and we asked the question, do you believe what your doctor has just prescribed? Guess what? A significant proportion of people did not believe it. Second question, do you believe or do you think that the prescription that you've been given will introduce harm or will do some harm to you? More than 50% believe that the prescription, the medical prescription will do something not good. So you're doing all this amazing research and you will hope that you will get to a cure or a treatment that works, but please, 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 please pay the way that people believe in what you're doing. And the third, and the part of the third, this is the third sample. The fourth sample is this next slide in what happens at home. Because we do all these struggles to connect with people for they come to see us especially. We will see them for 15 minutes, maybe 20, maybe 30 if you're overly generous. And when they come back at home, it is a social interaction, there are social circumstances, and how does this play? And this was a sample of diabetes. And food is important for us. And food is the thing, the thing that brings us together on the table that collectively we feel connected. And all of a sudden, we have to cook different for that person. Oh, yours low in salt, or yours that, and yours that. And people say, I don't want to do this because you are removing me from the table. And I want to use this pause, and I could well end my, my lecture in here to say that all the things that we're doing, caring for people matter and matter a lot, but it's not just about having a good treatment or a good access to a specialist. Let me run through a few number of, of, of studies because uh, how can we connect our prevention with you guys? I love this slide. Obviously, it's a dog. Is it a three-legged dog or not? Is it a patchy dog or not? Has it got a tail? I think this is one of my motivations to do research, what's going on out there. Peru is a very unique um, laboratory, as I was saying. If I were to have a pointer, but you can ask them where in the map they are. They are in the middle of the Amazon, particularly that green area. I'm from the north coast, the desert, and then we have a massive change of mountains, which are the Andes, up to 4,000 meters above sea level. How do you live there? That's a different question. Peru migrant study, people push out of the, the towns or the cities during the terrorism, a natural experiment allowing us to compare the cardiovascular risk factors of those who never left the rural area, of those who were forced to leave, and those who ended up in the city. Massive learning is the first line. Just take home message, just look at the top bar. 77% of these people living in rural areas do not have any of the major five cardiovascular risk factors that you will know they're important to a to the mention. They don't smoke, they have better profile of physical activity, they don't have elevated blood pressure, glucose is good, and lipids are good. And we keep looking at those with problems with problems, we should be learning from them. What is this guy excelling? What is good on them? So I wish that I could live there more. Following this over time, migrants are the ones who are at higher risk of developing obesity. The rural people are those who are at higher risk of developing hypertension and urban population are those at higher risk of developing diabetes. So when you look at populations in low and middle income country, we are not the same. And remember I said earlier, Latin America has transitioned into massive urbanization in the last few years. So that's another layer for you to think about. We saw that picture of the different settings. So what does it mean for those who are living in high altitude over time? What does it mean for those living in the tropics next to Ecuador? What does it mean for those living in Lima, a city with 15 million people? Okay, 10, still a lot. And you complain about traffic here. I will tell you what traffic is. Uh, oh dear. What it means is that we have these different patterns of comorbidities and the width, the, the circles are the conditions and the different circles are different prevalences and the width of the arrows are how connected they are. And this is my rejection lecture. I will, not, I will not become the Minister of Health in Peru because this is the headache I have to live with. Then I have to come with national policies, but the reality is that populations within my country are very different. If I were to be in Lima, I would have to prioritize something, some things, whereas in other settings, the priorities are very different. I'm gonna run through here, but if you're interested in uh, most of our data pulling efforts, very happy to combine you because to, to share with you 
because it's bringing data diversity during that heterogeneity. And for us making noise that whenever you see an estimate that is a national estimate improve, I'm unhappy to be quoted, do not believe it. Do not believe it. Who are you talking about? What does it mean? And that's the beauty, but also the difficulties of becoming part of this international community. The urban built environment, beautiful narrative of how the built environment determines your health and things that favor. Well, for us in Latin America, the narrative around urban determinants is very different. We're reporting things that go as, I don't think we're going against what it's reporting. What we're saying is that these things playing in a different way for us in Latin America that have not been previously reported. And just this idea that green is good for your health, no. We don't want to go to green because you get killed, you get robbed, or we don't have it. Uh, inequalities, 18 years of difference in life expectancy amongst the richest and the poorest, in, particularly in women in Santiago. What's going on? If you're a woman, if you go to Latin America to live, don't go to Santiago, please. Let's carry on, because I want to share this. The things can be done, things are possible. I'll take two more minutes, please, if I may. Um, what is the point of giving a label of hypertension when the clinical guidelines will tell you to do lifestyle modification for the first six months? Can you do it before? And if so, why not? Oh, because no, hypertension has been the domain of cardiologists, and then you have a specialist, et cetera. But actually, now we gain common sense that during the, all of these teleconsultations, we pair nutritionists or lab technicians to talk to people about the risk factors. And people don't want to talk about smoking if you don't smoke. People don't want to talk about exercise if you are maximizing exercise. So we let them choose. And we show reductions. Actually, we didn't see reductions in blood pressure, which was the point of that was my mistake in the study design, never again. We offer a trial to reduce blood pressure amongst people with prehypertension. When actually the task would be to maintain the blood pressure not to progress to hypertension. Five years on the line, year number one, we, we saw reductions in, in weight up to five kilos. And these reductions were sustained into four years or five years of the line. So I think the message here is that people, there may be easy gains and people are willing to connect despite all these difficulties. And I mentioned multiple difficulties of connecting with the health system and specialists, but maybe if we do something else and easier for them, it'll be helpful. This is for Alistair, who is here, food thermometry, another badly designed trial in terms of how to sell it for the international community, but a beautiful conducted this study because of the merit. So there's this tool called food thermometry. Basically, the behavior there is if you want to prevent Put ulcers, you need to check at your feet. And now it's even written in guidelines. You have to go to a doctor to check your feet. And uh, can we do it at home? Or is it, do we have to wait to be at the hospital to get off your socks? So there, this is screen, like a weighing scale. And there was evidence that in the US, people were using this thermometry screen and the adherence was 30%. But it's 30% in a context where you have many other multiple tasks. And we say, we're going to design a study to use digital health or mobile technology to add on to that baseline of thermometry. That was a failure because the uptake of these thermometry devices in a setting that nothing is doing for anything for this patient was 85%. 35% in the US, 85% in Peru. So the benefit to have an impact with any addition was minimized. So it was a negative trial, but positive relative Negative trial in terms of the comparators, but positive in terms of, of the uptake. I love this study because then can we go on that Geoffrey Rose experiment? Uh, can we shift the diet or shift the population mean of blood pressure? And there's this product that we use, and we love cooking. I said again, I want to do some publicity. People go on to gourmet uh, tours to Peru now. Restaurant, one, restaurant top one of the world is in Peru. It's overbooked six months in advance, but it will cost the daily wage, well, sorry, the monthly wage of the basic salary. So it's a huge differential as well. Anyhow, salt cooking, can we change the salt utilization? Can we use a different product that, use, that, it, 
that has potassium. Come potassium by itself reduces blood pressure. When you reduce the sodium, reduce the blood pressure. The combination of both two is even more powerful. And we show reductions at the blood pressure at the entire community. We'll swap the regular soul of stores, restaurants, community kitchens, street vendors. And we saw this thing that you can reduce blood pressure just not seeing any doctor, just by being what you're doing. And the incidence, the new cases of hypertension over time was 50% less, actually 55% less, amazingly. And then perhaps closer you to think about these comorbidities and uh, multi -con multiple conditions. I like that cit citation about him. He can, the patient can decide whatever they please in terms of which conditions to have. But the question here was, as part of the difficulties, people are coming to these health services. Why can we uh, not tap onto what else can be done? Can we look into their um, dementia, or oh, pardon, the mental health uh, comorbidities, and can we start addressing them? And again, not referring them to a specialist, but just having some companionship. Hello, how are you? And reductions in symptoms of, uh, of depression were notorious. And this was a study conducted simultaneously both in Brazil using primary care workers of the primary care plan in Brazil program, and in Peru using nurses paid by the, by, by the study. So we have these two scenarios, real life situation versus high. Um, I'm gonna run through this because cafeterias, our own cafeteria are not necessarily that more healthy, but the message here was who buys the fruits and vegetables? Why was the fruit was set? Why was the fruit set where it says fruit? Oh, because it's to avoid the flies. Can we change it? Yes. Can we reduce the price? Yes. Who bought the fruit? Woman. So how to do behaviors or behavior change with male, particularly adolescents or young male, is gonna be very different. Another entry point, why to queue at 4 a.m. in the morning to see a doctor if you can see a priest every Sunday? Can the priest say, say something about your prevention? And um, we use this cluster randomized trial with priests like me talking to you. And the message was 20 seconds saying, your body is your temple, please look after this. And the experiment was outside when we were offering in summer, white, uh, sorry, uh, water versus soda drinks. Okay, you can say insignificant, but the power of the voice, who says it? My next study is uh, if the priest versus a doctor. I reckon the priest will have more power. But I have to tell you this. My second study, I got the money and I got rejected by ethics. You see the power of the Catholic Church. They didn't like it. I still, the message I have it on my wall of fame. It's still not clear what is the scientific contribution to society of this type of studies. There you go. What are the outcomes that matters? So if you can reduce salt in bread, um, we went to the bakeries, can you reduce the amount of salt that you use, use? And they say, will it alter the flavor, the consistency, et cetera? And they say, what we care is about the price. We don't care about anything else. Are our sales going to be the same or not? And here they go. So moving into the system research right now, we're working on a project with dementia. I'm glad that we, I was able to meet Oliver early. And for me, addressing dementia with all this background, I hope that we can equalize the conversation. I cannot do anything on the treatment side or on the diagnostic side if we don't protect first the caregiver side. Because dementia happens and you have to live with it at home, not at hospitals and not at clinics. And I invite you to read this uh, there. We'll, I'm heavily invested in this project with these final lessons of persevering Persevering, persevering. And I stop here. Thank you. The importance of, of working locally, so so that we, we have guidelines, uh, broad guidelines based on, on, on massive populations, but Jaime has just demonstrated the importance of really looking at, at, at local populations, local groups, and even within within villages, uh, and how to address some of these uh, these features. Ah uh, yes, thank you. Uh, I'm interested in the in the study that you mentioned about uh, combining twenty five percent percent of potassium chloride with seventy percent of uh, sodium chloride. So I'm asking, what is the risk of uh, hyperkalemia in the in the study, and is that does the benefit outweigh the risk? Yeah, as the first question, uh, there is some risk theoretically. This was a community wide study. 
every individual 18 years old plus entering into the study, we saw zero cases of hyperkalemia and no uh, adverse effect. Thank you. Yeah, 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 totally. I, I, I get it. Yeah, I, I, I take that. I am an, an outlier in Peru. I, I don't represent. And I do get it. There's a lot of idealization of modern medicine. And actually, you can have clinics that are not dissimilar to what you have here or first world. But I suppose it's me and my background. So sorry, you chose me. And I don't represent the, the, the establishment. <laughs> Point taken. <laughs> Thank you. All right. Then, uh, join me again in thanking Jaime for his time. I believe there's a short break for tea and bathrooms. Um, 10 minutes, Lipe? Yeah. Okay, um, welcome back from that short mini break. Um, I am very, very pleased to have you all back here and um, would be very pleased to introduce Bill Yates to you. So Bill um, is somebody with lived experience of dementia. He is um, a reminder for us today of uh, why we're here and to talk about his uh, experience in managing his own journey. Uh, Bill is also pleased to share with you that he is doing his first keynote, in, international keynote at uh, Alzheimer's Dementia International in Poland in April. So we can applaud him for that. Um, but equally so, he's also just been selected in the Australian Masters um, swimming fin team in July. So he, he's achieving and, and kicking goals on many counts. So please, Bill, come to the the podium and talk to us about your experience. Thank you, Jackie. And um, good afternoon to everyone. Um, my experience, my journey, I think it has to start with, um, for four years up until two 2012, I looked after my father who died of dementia then and that's where probably where it started for me it was devastating for me to learn in 2019 in august 2019 that i had been diagnosed with younger onset alzheimer's disease i have no problems in saying that um i was full of anger i was i moved to shock grief it was a whole multitude of, of emotions then and quite simply i didn't cope at that time, I was around probably 86 k kilograms. I ate, I drank, my weight blew up to about 106 kilograms. I retreated from society. I didn't go out. I just felt sorry for myself. For me, I had no focus. Life meant very little to me. So to me, that's fairly typical in some respect to a lot of people who receive a diagnosis. It changes your life so much. But what was fortunate for me is that family, friends, they spoke to me, they talked to me, and I realised that I'd given up. And that really wasn't the way to look at life, that life is too good to give up without a fight. So my talk to you today is about that journey, and that's where it starts for me. And I have an identical twin brother who has shows no signs of um, Alzheimer's disease at all. So it was interesting. Again, I was lucky, fortunate. I had someone to talk to. Between the two of us, we decided there are two things that I needed to do. And the first was to involve, enroll into a novel clinical trial. I saw that as key. Not for a cure. In fact, there was only ever going to be a glimmer of a chance for anything to happen. But in the probably in the biggest gamble of my life, there were plenty of clinical trials around, but which one did I choose? I chose to move away from amyloid beta and tau hypothesis. 
I really thought that if I was going to have a chance at this disease, I realised it was incurable. I'd seen what it had done to my father. I needed something different. So I chose the neuroinflammatory response. And that was the trial that I looked for. And luckily for me, I found a 1B, phase 1B. It was run out of Cara Mines, and I enrolled into that. I had all the biomarkers for it. Everything was good. So I started that in early 2020. Um, it concluded in, uh, in the first quarter of 2021. And what was really interesting for me was that I felt differently. I actually, out, even after that period of time, it was a short period, but I actually felt differently. And more recently, last year, I was at the ADRF. I'd given a conference, I'd given a speak there, a talk there. And during lunch, I was actually walking around and it was really interesting. I came across my results. And that's what I'm going to show you here. 18 people started with us and because of side effects and the whole range of things, only six of us were left. But what was intriguing was that this lady here, I forget her name, she'd been sent out by Immune Biology and she spoke and I listened to her quite intently. So I was really obviously engaged and I really wanted to know what was going on. You can't actually see it, but in the first slide, there are two crosses. And I can honestly say to you, one of those two crosses is me. So, so that's good. Um, the second part, which is probably the one which is um, giving me the most pleasure or the most reassurance that I'm doing something right, um, was that I remember when my geriatrician gave me the diagnosis and she was very, very good. She told me certain things I needed to do. And, you know, we're all here about being remaining physically active, eating, socialising, sleeping well, all those type of things. But maybe it was because of my background, I actually needed something else. I actually needed something really structured. And I looked for it and I couldn't find it. So what I ended up doing was creating my own. And I did that through research and experimentation. And one of the things that... I like to say about the diagnosis, whether it's right or wrong, but it's not like any other disease. I really found when I talk about my experience, this darkness, I really found that who I was, my self-identity was taken away. So what I'm going to talk to you now is about the way that I lead my life. And for me, it goes way beyond a biophysical model deals a lot with my mind, my concept on life, et cetera, et cetera. For that reason, I broke my tree up into four components, body, mind, heart, and soul. And you'll see in it, for example, you'll see all the things that everyone talks about in terms of risk factors. And I have no problems. Every one of those I totally and utterly agree with. Like, for example, under, under body, you, you find healthy diet, you have quality sleep, keep active. Agree, totally. But you won't find rock pool swims. I swim during winter because for some reason I've found that if I swim in that cold water, it refreshes me. It actually does something. I can't, I'm no clinician, I can't tell you what, but I just know that it works better for me. Under mind, you'll see exercise your brain. Challenge yourself. My life is about, is about challenge setting goals achieving things because it has a positive impact on me. I feel it and I know it's good for me and socialising with people. I also wanted to share you at this point is that one of my leads, I've called it the neurocognitive exercise. So this is where I'm going to talk about later in terms of my journey. I competitively swim and involved in surf life saving. I couldn't do that unless I did this. So no sound. I'm sorry about it. It hasn't come through. But basically, um, this is Matt. He's an exercise physiologist. He's tracked me over four years from when I first started with him to where I am now. And it's in really interesting how he first, he talks about when I first came to see him, how I struggled. He couldn't really understand what I was saying. Confronting for me, but it's the truth. And then how I progressed over four years. This is towards the end. And I found that when I wanted to compete in swimming, I needed 
I needed help with my coordination, my balance and my reflex actions. And that's what that was actually doing. So I do apologize for that. The sound hasn't come through. In under heart, I've got professional healthcare team. I use allied health, lots of, in all different parts. And I cannot over impress how beneficial they've been to me. Find your passion. I've got to find things that gets me up in the morning. I have my ups and downs. But if I have a passion, if I enjoy something to do something, it's pretty important to me. And of course, my family. Under soul, I've got community service, work as an advocate, and enjoy nature. Every morning at 5.30, I take my dog for a walk. Um, one, like my dog, but more importantly, I walk along the beaches, I walk along nature. It engages my mind. It, you know, I'm just a real proponent of certain things. But it's interesting. I did get asked once, and I decided to put this as a slide, what are the two leaves that I think are the most important? And it's none of the ones that I've actually listed there. And I'm going to say that the first one is just keep swimming. And for me, and I think it means for a lot of people, is that if you want to achieve things, if you want to do things, life is going to, there'll be plenty of barriers. You can either choose to stop or try and get over it. And for me, just quit swimming fits that bill. And lastly, look for the silver lining. Uh, I mentioned those ups and downs. Trust me, if you can't see the positive in certain parts of your life, it is a real struggle. So for me, they're the most two. Um, probably to say is that I've been following this approach now for 1,430 days, which is just, just under four years. That's how long I've been doing it. And I've spoken too long. I know that. James, has, I've asked him to tell me that. But last thing I would like to say to you is that I've mentioned that I do do, I do compete. My tree won't get me there. I found that I needed something even more structured. So I went to reablement and I created a model because I couldn't find how to make a plan up, a bit like a rehabilitation plan. So simple process I use, person-centered assessment, creating a SMART goal. I build my plan. I implement it. I evaluate it. So I'd like to show you one if it's just very quickly and it'll just take me probably 30 seconds over. So this is one I created for running at a presentation that I gave last year. And running is a very important part of me as a surf lifesaver, a lot of the events I do. I can't run. I need to improve it. I need to somehow get it happening. And this is what I use. So there's an assessment there. There's my SMART goals, building your plan, created a plan, implemented it, and then I evaluated it. So that's what I try to do in all the aspects of my life. And I do apologise. I was trying to go quickly. I thought 10 minutes is a long time, but no, I'm sorry. So thank you for listening to me. Thank you so much, Bill. It's a powerful and motivating uh, talk for, for all of us. Um, so now we move on to the second half, the second, well, the middle part of this session, shall we say, where we're going to hear from two early career researchers. Um, so firstly, I'd like to introduce to you Dr. Aditi Horder. Um, so if, you, if you'd like to come down, thank you. So Aditi is a geriatrician with interest in cognition, neurodegeneration and end of life care. And she's currently working in the Southeastern Sydney local health district. She's in the third year of her PhD as well, studying tau interactors in Alzheimer's disease and frontotemporal dementia at the Brain and Mind Center. And today she's going to be telling us all about dementia in older adults, complexities and challenges. So, hi, I'm Aditi, and my talk today is on dementia in older adults. Um, a little bit about me for some context to this talk. Um, I did a dual science and medicine degree, and then in my seventh year of working as a doctor, I decided to go back to the lab. So I'm in the last year of my PhD with Glenda and Eleanor, looking at dementia pathophysiology, specifically um, phosphorylated tau interactors in Alzheimer's and frontotemporal dementia. Along the way, I finished off my geriatrics AT training, which was 
a little bit of a delicate balancing act. Um, it did mean there was a period where I'd say spend one day a week in cognitive disorders clinic, which is where we assess anything from subjective cognitive decline through to advanced dementia. And the rest of the week would be in the lab where our group uses uh, human brain tissue and I'd be doing cell culture and Western blots and very much bench laboratory work. Um, and the reason I bring this up is I hope today I can give a talk that appeals to both the basic scientists and the clinicians in the room about what I've learned along the way trying to do a basic sciences PhD as a clinician. So as geriatricians, we see a real spectrum of disease in dementia. Our patients are not just the 60-year-old relatively fit um, single pathology dementia. We see the full spectrum of frailty. Uh, right through to the bed bound, the institutionalized and those with advanced behavioral and psychological symptoms of dementia. There's huge variability in our patients. Um, they can vary in terms of their cognition, their frailty and their multimorbidity. And I think that's important to acknowledge that sometimes people don't present in the subjective cognitive decline or mild cognitive impairment stages of dementia. Sometimes they present quite late in their disease. And I found in my experience that's not uncommon in culturally and linguistically diverse populations in particular. And that has huge implications for research, particularly when a lot of the funding perhaps targets earlier stages of disease. There's a lot of heterogeneity in dementia in older adults. Um, to start with one disease, in Alzheimer's disease, you can present with a little bit of amyloid and tau, or you can present with marked protein deposition and brain atrophy. There's huge variation between the different subtypes of dementia. For example, in the tauopathies alone, um, as you can see in the staining on the brown, there's different patterns of tau deposition in um, neurons and glia in different diseases. There's different isoforms of tau, as you can see in the bottom right, and the ratio of these isoforms differs in different diseases. Tau differs in its post-translational modifications, in the proteins it interacts with, on top of all this diversity at a molecular level, anyone who works clinically knows that there's huge variability in our patients. Um, we can have patients with mixed pathology, as we've mentioned earlier, and we also have patients who um, are cognitively unimpaired despite having advanced neuropathology. There's this area of interest in cognitive resilience where we study protective factors and protein pathways that perhaps prevent the clinical phenotype of dementia occurring. So what I hope that impresses upon you all is that dementia is just so complex. How do we model this as basic scientists? Because that's a huge challenge when traditional models of dementia looked at overexpression of, say, one or two familial Alzheimer or frontotemporal dementia genes. It doesn't capture this complexity of neuropathology in older adults. And of course, this complexity has huge implications for the diagnosis and treatment of our patients. So one thing that I learned as a clinician um, when I entered the lab and started working with autopsy confirmed brain tissue is that we are getting it wrong. Our clinical diagnosis is not always correct neuropathologically. And this is a study from two brain donation cohorts, which found that more than a third of clinical diagnoses of dementia were incorrect neuropathology. So in the figure in the paper, green is correct and blue is incorrect. Um, for Alzheimer's disease, we're getting about a third of diagnoses wrong. Um, we're often missing uh, Lewy body disease or vascular dementia. But what I thought was quite interesting um, was the group of vascular dementia and clinically diagnosed mixed AD and vascular dementia. About a third of them had no vascular dementia or neuropathology. They often had Alzheimer's disease instead. On top of that, half of neuropathological frontotemporal lobar degeneration was incorrectly diagnosed. And I think as a clinician, that's really jarring because I spend 60 to 90 minutes in cognitive disorders clinic doing a history and exam, doing an ACE3, testing your letter fluency, your category fluency, looking at your neuroimaging, getting a collateral and presenting a case in MDT. And you're telling me a third of the time I could be incorrect. And that, apart from its implications on my pride, <laughs> has huge implications for diagnosis and treatment. For example, if you consider cholinesterase inhibitors, we're missing a cohort of patients that could have potentially benefited and a group that perhaps we're exposing to side effects when they would have had minimal benefit the whole time. And I guess that's like other talks have mentioned is where we do need to mention biomarkers. And although I feel our neuro neurology colleagues embrace biomarkers a little bit more, as geriatricians, I don't think we use them commonly and that's multifactorial. 
in some cases, it's simply not appropriate. Our patients are too immobile and frail to talk about lumbar punctures and PETs, and the plasma biomarkers aren't in widespread use just yet. Um, in other cases, a biomarker result wouldn't change our clinical management anyway, so why bother? But a big part, I think, of why we're perhaps a little bit slow to uptake biomarkers in the geri geriatrician clinics is that they're very difficult to interpret in our patients. A negative result is useful. If someone's got a negative amyloid or tau result, I won't prescribe a cholinesterase inhibitor. And a positive result in, say, a younger patient where I think there's a single pathology is useful as well, I'd perhaps refer to a clinical trial or try something like denepazil. But in an older adult, we often find that the biomarker result doesn't match what the clinical picture is, and it's difficult to know what to do with this in the presence of mixed pathology. And I think how we approach that as a profession is quite interesting. And I find it quite striking that patients with similar presentations can go to two different local health districts and get quite different treatment. In some places I've worked, there's a trend to acknowledge the uncertainty and prescribe a cholinesterase inhibitor if there is a hint of Alzheimer's pathology. In other hospitals, it's not really done that commonly. Um, I do also feel as geriatricians, we're a little bit slow to link patients in with clinical trials, as often disease-modifying therapy isn't linked in with, uh, those clinical trials aren't linked in with public hospitals. I won't speak too much about the anti-amyloids because that will be the panel coming up later this afternoon. There are appropriate use criteria, but unfortunately, older adults, especially those who are frail, comorbid, and particularly anticoagulated, aren't fantastic candidates for some of these therapies. And there was this study on the right published in neurology last year, which found less than 10% of patients in a real world memory clinic would actually be eligible for lecanemab and aducanumab if you use the strict inclusion and exclusion clinical trial criteria. Older adults, um, again, exposing them to aria and the risks of brain atrophy associated with anti-amyloids, I think is quite concerning. And there's the age old question as to whether the statistical improvement in their cognitive scoring translates to enough of a meaningful clinical benefit to expose them to these risks. I'll pivot a little bit now to talk about research in older populations. And I think these questions about appropriateness of older adults for things like these new drugs really reinforces that we need to be doing trials that involve older adults. When I was an intern, I was told geriatric medicine is an evidence-free zone, um, which I don't think is true, and certainly not these days. For example, again, not to be a clinician who loves the New England Journal of Medicine, but there was an excellent study last year um, that looked at trialing the MIND diet, which is a combination of the Mediterranean and the DASH diet against mild caloric restriction, and found that there was no um, significant improvement in global cognition scores between the two treatments at the three-year mark. Um, and I think these sorts of studies in older adults, be it on pharmacological or non-pharmacological interventions, are just so important when we make recommendations in memory clinics, because we should be upfront with our patients as to how strong the evidence base is for an intervention and the expected effect size, which seems straightforward. But these are the things that I see in clinic. I've seen things like a 50-year-old drinking souvenir that she doesn't enjoy for all in the hope it would help her intellectual disability, people spending money they don't have on vitamins that don't have widespread, widespread evidence for their use, children insisting people do crosswords and sudokus they don't enjoy. And I think there's been a bit of interest in longevity medicine, most notably Chris Hemsworth's physician, but unfortunately sometimes these spaces which aren't regulated and aren't official specialties, pedal things like these vitamins, they don't have a lot of evidence. And I think that makes it very hard for our patients because sometimes the evidence we have isn't getting through to the general population. So what do we actually tell patients? I think as we are generally often working without biomarkers, we have to be clear that the diagnoses we give people in clinic can be uncertain and can shift over time. We have to appraise the evidence base um, we probably could refer more to clinical trials. And I do think we need guidelines. ADNET have these fantastic memory and cognition guidelines released a few years ago. But I wonder if down the track, as the evidence updates, that perhaps we need guidelines that distinguish between appropriate investigations and treatments for younger, fitter patients compared to older, frailer patients, because I don't think one size fits all in dementia. So to wrap up, I just wanted to talk quickly about my PhD. 
Um, I mentioned earlier that it can be difficult to model the complexity of older adult neuropathology in a basic sciences level. So something that our group does um, is use human brain tissue and we extract the protein from patients who have neuropathologically confirmed Alzheimer's, Pick's disease, progressive supernuclear palsy and age match controls and add that to our cell culture, um, which um, uses neuroblastoma cells in the hope that this captures a little bit more of the complexity of real patient brains compared to overexpressing one or two genes. Uh, my PhD is then using this cell culture model to study proteins of interest. For example, we've got a novel phosphorylated tau interactor called Sokernin-1, which is stained for in green, um, and then studying how this affects other cellular processes such as tau aggregation. Another part of my PhD was um, developing hit prioritization criteria to objectively rank big data, um, such as the thousands of protein targets generated in proteomic studies in terms of favorability for drug development potential, acknowledging that perhaps uh, some of the drug targets for older adults could be better. Um, so my criteria prioritize things like safety and neural specificity with the hope that reduced off-target binding would reduce side effects in older adults and the eventual goal would be to then validate some of these targets in my cell culture model. So overall, dementia is complicated, older adult brains even more so, and I think there's a lot of room for basic scientists and clinicians to work together in this space. I do think we need more models of disease that more reflective, more sorry, accurately reflect the neuropathology in older adults. We need to keep doing clinical trials in older populations. And I think there's room to integrate biomarkers and eventually neuropathological diagnoses in these patients and who are in clinical trials. And I think when we are developing diagnostics and therapeutics for dementia, please remember that not everyone presents early in early stage disease. We need something for my patients too. Thanks so much. Thank you so much, Aditi. Um, just for, for time, I think we'll keep questions. If you have questions for Aditi or the next speaker um, or for Bill, um, then if you they'll be around at the networking session. Okay, so uh, the next speaker is Dr. Nathan Cross. So Nathan is an early career researcher with a PhD in psychology from the University of Sydney. And he's a sleep neuroscience, focusing on the role of sleep for maintaining cognitive health, leveraging EEG, MRI, neuropsychology, and sleep medicine. His work's covered multiple sleep disorders, including obstructive sleep apnea, insomnia, hypersomnia, and narcolepsy. So Nathan's currently a research fellow um, uh, working with Sharon Naismith um, to investigate topics such as sleep dependent memory consolidation, as well as brainstem modulation of sleep disturbances and glymphatic clearance in aging and neurodegenerative disease. And today, Nathan's going to talk to us about how the experience of sleep is associated with memory in later life. Thanks, Nathan. Thank you, and thank you um, for the invitation to speak today. Uh, this is a wonderful event. Um, I'm here today to talk about one of um, one lifestyle factor or risk factor that's being increasingly accredited or um, appreciated in the context of dementia and neurodegeneration, and that is sleep. Um, before I begin, I would just like to acknowledge the and uh, pay respect to the elders um, and the communities, past, present, and emerging of the lands uh, on which we stand. For thousands of years, they have shared and exchanged knowledge like we are today across innumerable generations for the benefit of all. So to get on to sleep and health and specifically brain health, um, like I said, it's becoming increasingly acknowledged as an important aspect of our health. And we know this because impairments in sleep um, can lead to a wide range of deficits. Um, Specific to our brain health, they can lead to not enough sleep, can lead to feelings of tiredness, and fatigue during the day, which understandably can impact our daily function. Um, poor or insufficient sleep impacts our ability to make decisions, solve problems, and remember things. And poor sleep quality over the long term has also been associated with um, increased symptoms of depression, anxiety, and poor quality of life. If we focus on cognitive impairment, we can categorize it or conceptualize it into two um, types, depending on the duration of the effects. So on one end, on the short-term acute phase, you can 
understand that day-to-day -day variability occurs in our decision-making, our problem-solving and memory. Um, and on the other end, in the longer term, um, the reduction in cognitive performance with example for um, age in later life over a longer term, um, we can consider that cognitive decline. And sleep can impact both of these aspects. And both of these aspects um, have a, can contribute significantly to a reduction in our quality of life, but also has a substantial cost on, on our society. But for the purpose of today's uh, uh, topic, I'll focus more on the cognitive decline aspect um, and its relationship to sleep. And what, what can go wrong with sleep, you might be wondering. Well, once there's an issue with sleep, we often call that a sleep disorder. Um, now, around 55% of people can be considered or conceptualized as good sleepers, and that is that they do not have any complaints related to their sleep or they do not have any objective sleep um, disorders. What are some sleep disorders? Well, by far the most common one is obstructive sleep apnea. This, hap this occurs in over a third of the general population. And it's a breathing disorder in which during multiple times during sleep, our, our airways are obstructed and our brains are starved from oxygen. The next common sleep disorder is insomnia disorder. And this is a dissatisfaction with sleep and daytime with a key component being an impact on our daytime abilities. There are some less common um, but more severe sleep disorders such as the hypersomnolence disorders, which um, uh, present, sorry, present as excessive daytime sleepiness. And in narcolepsy, there's uncontrollable uh, sleep onset. People are falling asleep uncontrollably. And there are some movement disorders associated with sleep. So during sleep, especially during the deep um, part of sleep where we're dreaming, um, normally our bodies are paralyzed and still, but in these behavior, um, uh, movement disorders like REM behavior disorder, our body is moving um, on, uh, during our sleeps and we're acting at our dreams. There are some other sleep disorders that are a lot less common, um, such as restless leg syndrome and circadian rhythm disorders, that is misalignment of sleep timing and set. And these prevalences are all um, from the general population. And I must point out these are from Western countries, Australia, North America, Europe. Um, it's a lot harder to get statistics on other areas, but this is from the general population. If we specifically start looking though in neurodegenerative diseases, um, you'll see that the prevalence of these sleep disorders actually dramatically increases. So if you take, for example, insomnia disorder, it's prevalent in around one in 10 people in the general population. When you get to all-cause dementia, it shoots up to 27 to 50% of patients. Um, we look at sleep disorder breathing. Um, it normally with aging incre increases in prevalence. But when you look at some dementias, specifically vascular dementia, it's really prevalent, it's 75% of cases. And then there's the movement disorders, which are very quite rare in uh, general population, around 1%, 2% in older adults. Then you look at patients with Parkinson's disease and that goes up to 40%. And dementia with Lewy bodies, it's pretty much every case has REM behavior disorder at some point. So there is a specificity, a specificity of the relationship between certain sleep disorders and certain neurodegenerative diseases. But I think what we can really take away from here is that prevalence rates of sleep disorders increase in neurodegenerative disease. And sleep has become mentioned more and more in the context of dementia and neurodegeneration as both a risk factor and a symptom of neurodegeneration in that a negative cycle might commence later in life where declining sleep quality or these sleep disorders may be both a result of and contribute to neurodegenerative processes. So the relationship is quite complex, it's not clear cut, and we're still researching more and more to understand these relationships. But how do we know, or how does someone know when there is an issue with their sleep? Well, this is where um, symptoms reported by caregivers or significant others is very important. Um, they may report these things because it's disturbing on their own sleep. And these can be things like snoring, and obstruction of airways, which could lead to sleep apnea, or movements during sleep, which could be those movement disorders I mentioned. There are also objective sleep tests, um, which can diagnose certain sleep disorders. Um, they can measure blood oxygen levels, airway obstruction, 
these movements during sleep, are they how often they're occurring during sleep? Are they occurring at the wrong times? And you can even um, have sleep tests that measure sleep deprivation or excessive sleepiness and can tell you whether that excessive sleepiness may be pathological or not. And while these sleep tests are really important and can give us a lot of rich, detailed information on what's going on during sleep, such as sleep architecture, microarchitecture, um, I think what's really important is also self-awareness around sleep in the context of aging and dementia. It's very important because it's one of the earliest symptoms that we can, can assess in people, but it's also one of the most complicated ones. It's very hard to identify what something is happening inside yourself and whether it's a change. Um, but self-awareness of sleep, um, I think, can help us understand sleep disorders more. So these can be symptoms such as, am I excessively sleepy during the day? Am I having trouble focusing or paying attention? Um, or simply, am I dissatisfied with my sleep pattern, my sleep habits, my sleep quality, and is it causing me an issue? And because this is such a complicated area on itself, um, I would like to address the importance of why awareness of sleep and the subjective experience of sleep is important in the context of aging and dementia. And this is a lot more related to that sleep disorder, insomnia disorder. So insomnia disorder is a sleep disorder, but you may or may not know it is primarily a psychological disorder and that it's in the DSM-5 and it's based diagnosed solely on self-report. This self-report is difficulties in initiating and or maintaining sleep, a dissatisfaction in your sleep quality, and key here, these impairments have these these symptoms have to be impairing your daytime functioning, so decision making, remembering things. You may ask, though, does insomnia actually infer an increased risk for cognitive decline or dementia? Well, to answer, try to attempt to answer this question. Um, while I was a postdoc in Canada, we had access to this large um, cohort study across Canada, around thirty thousand people, in which. Uh, there were self-reported evaluations of sleep, memory, light, sociodemographic factors. And importantly, there were also objective cognitive tests um, evaluating performance in different domains, including memory. And from the self-reported evaluations on sleep, there was a, quite a detailed interview. We were able to conceptualize sleep from no issue at all to this quite severe um, end of insomnia such that we categorized the participants into three groups, no sleep symptoms whatsoever. On the other end, all these criteria that meet insomnia disorder. And this group in the middle that reported some difficulties initiating and or maintaining sleep, but they weren't dissatisfied with their sleep quality. And importantly, it didn't impact on their daytime functioning at all. So they, they are noticing some things with their sleep, but it wasn't impacting them. When we look at the, the the proportion or prevalence across the cohort, we saw that the insomnia group was actually only around 3.7%. The sleep symptoms were around 19%, and the majority of people had no insomnia symptoms. Here you already might be noticing, but hang on, you told us that before it was around 10% in the general population that increased with um, dementia, so we'd expect a higher rate. We'll keep that in mind as I show you the next result in that we found that this insomnia group actually decreased with age. So this also is counterintuitive, as you would think that it would increase with age because we know these neurodegenerative diseases are increasing with age. However, I think this is a, a reflection of the, the participants that were recruited for this study in that at the baseline, they had to have an absence of cognitive impairment and no prior diagnosis of dementia, stroke, or major head injury. And so this, in itself is an indirect indicator that insomnia disorder goes against successful cognitive aging in that people who are successfully cognitively aging to up to 75 plus years of life are less likely to have insomnia disorder. What we also found in this study was that those with the insomnia group um, had poorer health outcomes. They were more likely to be smokers, um, have anxiety or depression, pain, um, diabetes, they were also more likely to be females and they were less likely to drink alcohol. But the key takeaway here is when we looked at these objective cognitive tests, the neuropsychological testing across multiple domains, it was specifically within memory that the primary insomnia disorder showed a decrease compared to the other two groups. 
So we found that insomnia is related to worse memory function in, in middle age and older adults, but this was cross-sectional data only. Um, and so it doesn't show us any longitudinal change in their, their cognitive performance over time, but also doesn't help us answer when was the age of onset of this insomnia? We couldn't ascertain that from this first study. Um, was someone with, say, for example, at 70 years of age reporting insomnia, had that started recently or had that occurred for 20 plus years of their life? So we were interested in understanding, is there a relationship between the development of insomnia in middle age and changes in subjective and objective cognition? To do that, we came back to this cohort and we looked at follow-up data after three years. Um, and we took everyone from the baseline study who had not reported any insomnia symptoms. And we looked at after three years, did they develop insomnia or not? See so quite a small percentage in developed insomnia about a quarter of them um, developed sleep symptoms and 55% remained stable. Similar to the, the baseline study, we found that those in the insomnia group had poorer health outcomes, similarly to um, the, the baseline. But when we looked at their objective memory performance on the, the tests, we did not find any differences um, between the insomnia group and the other groups. But when we did split it up by, by biological sex, we found that men were at greater risk with insomnia of objective um, memory impairments compared to women. What we also looked in this study was um, subjective memory decline across those three years. And this was ascertained by two questions. Firstly, has a doctor ever, a self-report question, has a doctor ever told you that you have a memory problem? And do you feel like your memory is becoming worse? And what we saw was, again, the insomnia group had a greater risk of developing both of those than the other two groups. And why is this important? Well, we know that on the continuum of um, Alzheimer's disease or, or dementia, uh, subjective cognitive impairment is one of these earliest prodromal stages that incurs an increased risk for developing dementia. And so if insomnia disorder is increasing the risk of subjective cognitive de decline, it's then likely to be potentially contributing more to the, um, the descent of the cognitive decline What's also important here to look at is that um, with insomnia or any sleep disorder, you can uh, intervene. And the earlier we intervene, just like with any intervention into dementia, um, we could shift the needle there. I'll just very quickly, I, I have one more minute. Um, I'll, I'll go over some quick treatments for insomnia. Uh, cognitive behavioral therapy is a psychological therapy. It's the first line treatment for insomnia. Um, it includes um, reframing cognitively your beliefs about sleep, but also helping with sleep hygiene um, behaviors. Medication um, is something you may have heard around, but uh, medication is not recommended in old adults, particularly benzodiazepines. Melatonin is often um, heard. Is that useful for insomnia? It can be useful in the short term for very acute insomnia, but it's not recommended in the long term. And a lot of experts in the field will tell you less is more. And just to give you a brief tease of what's coming, what might be there in the future, um, there are some novel sleep interventions that are being developed, such as rocking beds to help with sleep quality, as well as um, stimulation of brain waves during sleep that may, uh, may impact our sleep quality as well. So to finish with, sleep is fun, uh, undoubtedly important for our brain health. And it links with dementia are very complex and are still not understood. What I'd like you to take away from this talk is that just like subjective memory complaints or subjective cognitive decline, subjective reports of sleep are incredibly important in the earliest possible um, intervention and detection. And it can be one of these canary in the coal mine incidents that if people are understanding that their sleep's changing, this could be an important time to act and focus on interventions. So don't underestimate your sleep and recommend our patients seek treat advice or treatment. Um, I'll just finish there. I'm working with the incredible Professor Sharon Naismith at the Healthy Brain Aging Clinic in the Brain and Mind Center. So please scan if you would like any more information on that. Thank you. Thank you very much, Nathan. Um, I don't know. I imagine I'm not the only person who's going to be Googling rocking beds. <laughs> Sounds amazing. Um, so um, it's now my pleasure to hand over to the chair for the next session.
So Professor um, Vasi Naganathan, who's going to be chairing the panel discussion. We might get the panel to come down, I think. So you want me to sit then? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So Hello. Welcome, everyone. Um, my name is Darcy. I'm a geriatrician at Concord and academic. Academic. Sydney, the pleasure of hosting this panel. So maps are on the way. Um, they're approved in the US. They'd like to be approved by the TGA. We don't know when and probably approval with the PBAC may or may not happen. So we really need to start thinking about what are the implications for dementia diagnosis and management? Who should we be seeing? Where should we be seeing them? What diagnostic services do we need? How do we give two weekly infusions? How are we going to deal with ARIA? How do we manage expectations? And for me, there is a sense of deja vu about this because I started as a consultant in about 2000 and we had all some of these discussions about cholinesterase inhibitors. What are going to be people's expectations? Who do we give it to? My mentor, Helen Creasy, who's trained as a neurologist, talked to me about the problems. She said, Vasi, they're missing the vascular disease. Don't they know how important the thalamus is? I had the pleasure of sitting at the brain donation studies where, as you said, we realized how wrong we were. Olivier remembers those. And the neuropathologists, oh, they were so smug, weren't they? So to help us answer these questions, we've got a distinguished panel. Um, that span clinicians. We've got Bill, who you've met. Um, Dimitri's a GP, and Peter Gonski's a head of geriatric medicine, and he's going to have to think about these things. So I've got a series of questions to stimulate discussion, but we're not going to get too caught up in what's the evidence for and against the maps, because that's a whole nother talk. We thought one good way to start is we're going to get... Amy and Michael, who see a lot of people with dementia, to talk about how they would talk to a patient about the MADS, the pros and cons about actually taking the MADS. And when we brainstormed this, I made the point, well, I'm only going to give you five minutes each, and in the real world, you'd probably talk to someone for longer. But both of them pointed out in the real world, you even with our long consultations, you don't have much long to explain it to a patient. So I think Amy's going to start, and then Michael, uh, imagining that they're explaining to a patient about the MABs. Working? Yeah. So exactly, Michael. Both said um, the, we wouldn't have more than five minutes. Um, and in fact, this happened yesterday. Happened. Sorry, everyone. 
Um, and I was chatting to a patient who brought it up and actually said, what's happening? I don't, we were talking about trials and I was at the end of the consultation saying, are you interested in trials? And they said, no, but I want that drug. And that I'm sure is what's happening. I know Michael said that this is happening. So the conversation is often initiated by patients at the moment because of what's happening in the media. And so the conversation that I'm having with them is that, you know, we don't know what the TGA decision is going to be. And we, and I'm very frank, we don't know how we're going to implement this. I say that it's likely that um, if it is, if these drugs, well, this, this is first in class, but if this drug is actually approved by the TGA, it's very possible that it'll only be available in private first. We think, think that the estimated costs are going to be about 60,000 Australian per annum, which does not include the costs of the MRIs, the PET scans, and any other costs that may come up. And that MRI cost is if you don't have a complication, because if you have ARIA, which is one of the known complications, the brain imaging changes, you have to have monthly scans until that resolves. I say to them that the benefits look like probably around six months of stabilisation, but that it's not a cure. These don't cause, a, if you like, a reversal of your symptoms. There is some evidence that hopefully Michael will speak to um, from last week's conference that there is really good stabilisation in some patients. That's all post hoc analyses, not pre-specified. So the biostatisticians in the audience will disagree with that. And I say that there are complications. And my experience is that there's a group of patients when I talk about the complications who state that they don't care, they just want the drug. And that as soon as, and there's a group of patients that when I say there's a, there's a chance of brain swelling or brain hemorrhage, the conversation ends there. So that's my summary. Well, you're lucky, Mrs. Chan, because I've just come back from the conference in Lisbon, the ADPD conference, where some new data was presented. These drugs are going to be helpful for a very large number of people in the early stages of Alzheimer's. It looks like the benefit continues if they're moved beyond, if they're used beyond the 18 months from the clinical trial. In fact, we now have data out to three years, suggesting that by three years, you're going to be close to a year better off than if you weren't on the drug, um, as long as you tolerate and are suitable for the drug. You are in the mild stages of Alzheimer's, and we know from data that was presented last week that if we get you before tau goes up, I don't know what your tau is, although I might have a blood test by the time I'm having this conversation in the near future, but I don't know what your tau level is, but if your tau has not started to rise, um, and particularly if it's not moving from your uh, medial temporal cortex into, your, into the surface of your brain, you might actually stabilise. You might not deteriorate for a period of time. I don't know how long. So I think it's very good to have this discussion, but you do need to know that these drugs are going to be expensive. We haven't yet worked out the logistics of giving them, um, but they hopefully will get TGA approval and be available in Australia soon, at least one of them, lecanemab. Uh, I would propose that now that we know that you've got an amyloid PET scan, I've done that to confirm your diagnosis. Um, you, have, uh, you have a positive amyloid PET scan. Um, you're suitable on that front. Your MMSE is 27. That makes you suitable. You don't have any um, uh, major medical comorbidities that stop you being in the, uh, using the drug. So let's, let's um, bring you back in a couple of months and hopefully by then we'll have TGA approval and have the logistics sorted out. You do need to know about the side effects. About 16% of people get what's called aria, which means either swelling or uh, bleeding uh, in the brain. In most cases, these are without symptoms uh, and usually resolve sometimes by continuing the drug and just watching you. Sometimes we have to stop the drug temporarily and sometimes we have to stop it completely. But it's so good that you're interested in this drug and I hope to be able to offer it to you in the next few months. And just moving away from the scenario, I just want to make one point. I think we're at a crucial point here. Um, if we are too negative about the drugs, too concerned about them, et cetera, or worried about what our patients will think about them, and, and indeed other factors such as costs and logistics, it could kill them. That's that's what's happening in, in, in the atmosphere of these conferences. 
when the results were first presented last year, everyone was extremely excited about the MABs. But my concern is if, if we have too much pushback from doctors, including geriatricians and neurologists, from patients, from health providers, they could die. And it'd be a bit like you know, not using gold for rheumatoid arthritis. This was well before any of you were born, but it was an amazing uh, development, a disease-modifying drug. It didn't work very well. It was terribly toxic, but it was the beginning. And now look at the drugs we have for rheumatoid arthritis. Same as pushing back with, against the mercurials for heart failure. Terrible drugs, but the first step. This is a first step. This is the end of the beginning. And if we push back too hard, I fear for where Alzheimer's research and particularly Alzheimer's therapies are going. Thank you, Michael. So we warned Bill about this. Um, this is a tough task. Bill, in light of what you've heard, your thoughts and perhaps even your questions. I suppose a lot of it comes from my background, um, being a pharmacist of, before I was a teacher, and my involvement in the clinical trial. And can I say, if I was a patient of both of you, I'd be very happy. But, and I say that quite honestly because I think one of the most important things for me is to try and, under, try and understand what were the benefits and what were the side effects. And therefore, if I'm going to make a decision to be involved, taking this drug then it's got to be a voluntary decision i have to understand the information that you've conveyed to me um, as best as i can but at the end of the day i'm doing a weighing up and so can i applaud for that i like it really enjoyed it i listened to you um i did it was all right i did like a tick and all that stuff. <laughs> however um the only thing that's probably my background is that i know that when i you know, it was for a clinical trial not against uh, a MAB, but I, I actually wanted to know what the drug was actually going to do. Like, for example, with a MAB, like, like bring it right, right down, just as a synthetic drug or um, how it sort of latches, if I get it right, latches onto a protein and induces the immune system. As simple as that would be something I'd probably, but again, I have to be careful. I know that what I would want to do, want to know, wouldn't be actually the same as everyone else. Everyone is different. Everyone sees it differently. But I can only say, look, that was the only difference or advice I would give. But and I applaud both of you. Uh, you're probably thinking, what's he going to say? But I really enjoyed how you approached it and what you had to say. And I said, geez, I wish I was hearing those type of stories of what you find. So thank you. Um, you would have all gathered that both uh, both Michael and Amy talked about working out who needs to get the treatment, right? Who's suitable for the treatment? Who would they consider? So I might give both Amy and Michael to give you a bit more detail, of, detail about that, and then we'll take it from there. So, I mean, the problems with this drug... Well, me, Holly. Um, I think I'm toxic to it. Um, we have data from trials, and when I'm consenting my patients for trials, I essentially said the pharmaceutical companies, you know, if they want someone with purple eyes and green hair, I have to go out and find them. We know that the screen fail rate for these studies was 80% for some of them. So, and you saw uh, Adidas presented some beautiful, wonderful talk. Um, some data from the Mayo study, um, with the, from the Mayo Clinic, where they looked and they saw that only around 10%, probably less than 10% are eligible. So as Michael said in his scenario, we need people who are otherwise well, free of most other comorbidities. They can't be vasculopaths. They can't be on dual antiplatelets. They can't be on anticoagulants, probably although the trials did include people. Um, they can't have other significant disease. They have to be at the mild stage of the disease. They have to be supported. They probably have to be financially fine, um, at least for the start. 
And there's going to be a large number of people who are excluded when we go through that screening process. So we're going to have to consider healthcare systems that actually just set up triage and treatment eligibility and assessment services. Um, we then have to know what to do with those people who don't actually through. That you make those decisions in a multidisciplinary way. Yep. Do you want to just a bit more about that to the audience? Yeah, absolutely. So these are, I mean, I think that in the future that these, these clinics would be staffed best by good cognitive nurses um, and, um, and also by a, a range of clinicians, including um, occupational therapists, neurologists, aged care specialists, geriatricians, potentially psychiatrists, and absolutely GPs. I mean, ultimately, this is going to have to be something that will be eventually run via primary healthcare networks, um, but I don't know how that's going to look. Um, and I think that the, that evaluation and support is going to be essential because for the people who don't get the drug, who can't get these drugs, they still need support. And our primary responsibility is support and care. Michael, if you start with the, tell people a bit more about the, um who's suitable and not suitable, and how you then do that. I think we agreed on the MDT, but it'd be nice for you to talk I mean, about I that. think Amy's covered most of the, the issues. I mean, yes, it did look like only 10% of our general clinical practice might be suitable, um, but it also depends on our clinical practice. I tend to get more of your you know, off-the-street Alzheimer's straightforward patients than you might get in the memory clinic, which are often multiple comorbidities, much more complex. To answer Bill's point, just very briefly, um, these drugs work by lowering amyloid down to essentially normal levels. In fact, um, there's some new drugs such as trontinurumab that uh, in about 80% of cases, I think it's 73% of cases, your, your amyloid level essentially is normal within 12 weeks. Within 12 weeks, your brain is devoid of amyloid essentially. Um, now that secondarily seems to also affect tau, although that's a bit more controversial. So they work on the two major pathologies. Of course, we've heard today there are many other things going on in the brain. Uh, vascular disease, TDP43, et cetera. So the conversation I have to the patient is, I don't have any good evidence that you've got vasc significant vascular disease. And by the way, I'm uh, uh, beware of the, the CT that says, you know, or the MRI that says white matter changes and the other geriatrician or the other neurologist has said, you've got vascular dementia. <laughs> they haven't. They've got incidental vascular changes. They've got predominantly Alzheimer's if they've got a strongly positive scan. So, you know, you, you, you have... You have um, the possibility of other other uh, pathologies, but I think your main pathology is straightforward Alzheimer's disease. I think you're therefore suitable for this medication. Um, there are logistic issues. You've got to come in every second week for intravenous infusions, and uh, uh, as, as Amy said, you've got to have somebody with you. But um, I, I think I, I want to go into this with a with with a, with with, a, with due constraint. Um, doesn't sound quite right when I say what I'm about to say, but I want to go into this with all guns blazing rather than with timidity. And Michael, do you do you agree with Amy that you'll be making the decisions in a multidisciplinary with the team, with the radiologist? Absolutely. Yeah. But so, so where it's being used in the States, there's usually a group of three or four people um, that get together to decide whether a patient is suitable. That's probably going to be necessary for some time until we get a better feel for it. Just like when we started ACE inhibitors, again, before most of you were born, it was a big decision to start somebody on ACE inhibitor. Many people were involved in that decision. And I think we're going to have to do the same with these drugs until we get a lot more knowledge of them. And we get safer and more effective drugs because we will. Um, so this naturally leads on to the question about where should the triaging happen? Who you know, we don't want, probably not going to work if there's an avalanche of people coming to specialist memory clinics, geriatricians, neurologists, settlement, right? So the obvious place is in primary care, right? Is that where some of the discussions about whether someone's suitable for a MAB or not actually should happen? And keep in mind that Dimity's got expertise in the area. Um, your thoughts, Dimity? Right. Thanks for that. <clears throat> well, I think if I think most of us are aware that primary care do triage people, that we're there actually as gatekeepers for the healthcare system. 
uh, we're not supposed to refer everyone off to the geriatrician, the hospital, or, you know, for a, 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 some sort of cardiac procedure or whatever uh, un until we think that that's justified. And that's what's keeping our healthcare costs below that of the states, which allows anyone to go anywhere. So, so th that's, the, that's the position that we come from. We've also been told by our college that we're not supposed to screen for dementia. That means we're not supposed to just say, pick every 75 year old that comes in and administer some sort of cognitive function test. They need to have symptoms. So these are the sorts of basic things that we come from, uh, basic context, context. The other thing is the literature on how GPs make, uh, make a diagnosis or, or consider someone at risk of dementia uh, really talks about quite a lengthy process of sussing out that person's uh, it, often uh, rarely people come and say, I've got memory problems, I want to go to the memory clinic. That's simple, but it very rarely happens to me. Less than once a year. Um, well, less than that. So, so I'm looking at someone who has begun to get a bit confused about their medication. Well, I don't know. They're late for one or two appointments because they forgot their bank card, their card and their pin number. And does that is that do I even bring that up? I would have to raise it and say, have you got a problem? So you're looking at a behavior change that's required from general practice. And we need to be convinced, guys, that it's worth it. And in, we're going to refer people off for a diagnosis which may affect their driving. It may affect uh, people in the family implementing the power of attorney. I've known people who've been diagnosed with dementia by the, uh, by the orthopaedic surgeon in the recovery ward and have been whizzed off to residential aged care within the few weeks by their family and the unit sold from under their uh, noses. So th these, these are, we're living in the messy real world that uh, Jamie nicely described for us. Uh, so we don't want to rush into this necessarily. But on the other hand, we don't want people to miss out. So actually there needs to be a fair bit of discussion with primary care, I think, to get a clear pathway and a clear pattern of signs and symptoms that we would recognise and exclusion criteria. If, if this person is living on a pension and, you know, I know that their house is fairly bare because I've been there once or twice, uh, uh, you know, I probably won't raise it with them. I don't think they're going to be able to. Do <laughs> so there's, so, uh, so, and the, the other exclusion criteria that you mentioned uh, like multiple comorbidities is one that, you know, I, I might not, I might pursue my usual range of options, uh, which is just sussing it out, raising a few issues with them. You know, have you thought about your memory? And it, it might take months uh, before I, I get them. But if they seem to qualify and I need to know what that might be and they could afford it, then I would need to raise it with them earlier than I usually do. So I need to be clear on that. I'll give you some extra context and your thoughts. So once a month, I do a clinic in Griffith and Leeson, Murrumbidgee, and the majority of people I see, it's a general clinic, but the majority of people I see for dementia. Now, a lot of the doctors, the GPs there, well, no, all of them are frightfully busy. I can't tell you how busy they are. I mean, they're busy enough in metro places, but in the country, regional areas, they are frightfully busy. So they have limited time, right, to get all the things they have to do, get done. And many have, have trained in countries that don't, you know, as Jamie mentioned earlier, they don't learn much about dementia, right? They, you know, from, you know, because parts of the world, the Indian subcontinent, the Middle East, uh, in China, it's, it's, you know, dementia knowledge is still being developed and they haven't got the time. Now, thank God, they're saving our health system because if they weren't working, those country towns will fall apart. Dimity, any thoughts on regional? I mean, we, we do stuff in Pellet, so the decision in Griffith would be 
right? Are you suitable for that? Do you travel to Sydney? Which memory, which unit do you go to in Sydney? Uh, can we do this via telehealth? Where would you get the MRI scan? And of course, all the extra costs. But we might eventually work that out. It's just an extra logistic point. I agree. It would be an extra logistic point. And I know that there are several groups working on uh, diagnosis uh, using telehealth and so on. And some of them for a long time, rural Queensland, has been yeah, accessing that for ages. And it may need uh, someone there in the room with them. It may need some nursing or medical support free, free that. Um, we could work that out. We just need to be clear about it. And we probably need to start on clarifying that now. Because I agree with you that one of these drugs, maybe not the two that are in the pipeline or the three or whatever it is, or the other 27 in the pipeline at the moment, one of them will probably work eventually and will need to be able to refer people. Um, uh, of, the, um, of the heads of department in Sydney, Peter probably has probably the best connections with primary care over a long period of time. And actually, Peter actually is even now joint clinics with general practitioners in South Peter, I'm going to ask you a few things today. I'm going to start with reports. We are in general practice, how that would be done. At the moment, uh, we have an incredibly good relationship with our general practitioners. That, unfortunately for us, gives us a lot of referrals. And I think, although it's said that they don't do um, screening, um, they certainly send a lot of patients to us. And as we know, many of those patients actually don't have dementia or mild cognitive impairment, but have other symptoms of other things. But when we do get those patients, we have to then screen them ourselves, of course, and do a full assessment. And we will need to include the GPs right from day one. But once we have those patients and we diagnose them, then we obviously have to be prepared that they will ask us about these drugs and we need to be extremely prepared from a department and a district point of view what are we going to say to them and what are we going to do with them and who are we going to give them to and, and also how are we going to give it? And that's all fairly complex. But from our point of view as a district, we are starting to make the plans. We, if I could just push along with some of the, some of the discussion that's already been mentioned, we are going to put together multidisciplinary teams. And that only, not only includes doctors, but also other people who deal with people with um, mild, mild cognitive impairment, cognitive issues, nurses, occupational therapists, physiotherapists, et cetera. However, we also have to include the different specialists, as mentioned, neurologists, uh, psychiatrists, and geriatricians particularly, and we have to involve the public and private medical people. And because that's a big, big issue, because we can't just say, everyone who we diagnose is in the public system and we should go down one track. What are the people who are seeing private people going to do? And we get referred a lot of patients from private neurologists to take over their care and follow up their ongoing care for dementia. So uh, there's a lot to do, and but I think we are starting to look at the whole model. And within that, we've also started another model which encompasses dementia from diagnosis to death. So we will actually be picking up people right from diagnosis and following through over many, many years. Um, and as a part of this, it will include these drugs, how we're going to administer them, who we're going to administer them to, and also research into that area. Can I ask you, the two specifically, radiology and uh, fortnightly infusions, thoughts on that? Is that that's going to be so, one of the two big resource implications? Okay. If I was asked what's the biggest hurdle, I'd say the cost of the drug at the moment. But if we talk about radiology, um, fortunately, radiologists can do lumbar punctures, and they do. So I don't think that's the biggest problem. MRIs, certainly we can get MRIs, but monthly MRIs might be a different situation. 
Amyloid pets, I think, are much more difficult, particularly in New South Wales. I think they're better off in Victoria um, because they've already been doing a lot of research in this area. So I think that's a really big problem is amyloid pets. But as we progress and we mature, I'm sure that's going to be much easier to get. As far as giving the, the medication, I think we, we've all um, gone down ambulatory care units, infusion units. I don't think that's the biggest issue at all. I think we also have to learn from our oncology um, colleagues that they've started with medications that are very expensive, that are not on PBS, and they've carried people through, and then subsequently these, the drugs they use have become um, accepted on PBS, and that makes life much easier for a lot of situations. So um, I don't see infusion as a big deal. I think radiology is going to make, we will get to a stage of that's not going to be the biggest deal. I think it's the cost. Peter, you actually, as you asked Peter the question I was going to spot, respond to, I think you know, radiology isn't a deal, but they need training. They've got to be able to pick up ARIA. That's my biggest concern. But there are training packages online at the moment. But I would also, also see these drugs as an opportunity to introduce a whole care package. Uh, it very much in conjunction with with primary care, nursing and, and general practitioners. We need to have a patient sent to us for a treatment package, a lifestyle package, the sort of things that were on your tree, Bill. Uh, and in fact, you might have to add one more small leaf, which is the monoclonal antibodies, but it's not going to replace the whole tree. People would then say, why did you require the mass before you guys thought about writing a comprehensive package? I mean, that's... That's the obvious thing. Well, some places have been providing comprehensive packages, but I think no, I think our our and when I see a patient, I'd refer them to Dementia Australia. I talk about that diet, although the mind diet has come under some scrutiny, etc. But uh, we need a better way of supporting them, like like in the um, the finger studies and those multi multifaceted interventions. We need to be able to have that as routine care, and then the MABs added on top of that. So the MABs, in fact, it's sort of a reverse process. The MABs might actually make us more aware of the need for everything else and make that more available. Michael, while you've got the mic, do you want to say something to the audience about what you told us about the protocol to deal with ARIA? Well, probably important to the audience to know. So, so in Australia, we're developing appropriate use guidelines of these medications. Um, uh, Colin Masters, Chris Rowe, myself, Cathy Short, and a couple of others. Um, uh, are you on that too? I think, anyway, there's a GP on it as well. Um, and um, uh, we're trying to work out how best to use them, who's appropriate, et cetera. And as part of that, there is an algorithm for how to deal with ARIA. It's not that difficult. Basically, it works based on the severity of the radiological changes and the severity of the symptoms. And it ranges from uh, no change in dosing, but more frequent MRIs right through to never dose again. We haven't mentioned ApoE4. That's an important part of this equation. Most of these people need to have E4. E4 makes them much more prone to ARIA uh, and possibly less responsive to the MAB. So there may be a, a recommendation that uh, particularly E4 homozygotes, which are about 20% of all Alzheimer's patients. Um, they're only about 5% of all people in the general population, but they may be uh, not the first choice for the MAPs. Uh, I just wanted to comment on the package idea. Um, and I think uh, we in general practice are a bit behind the eight ball with post-diagnostic support. I don't think most GPs are really across that. Um, I do uh, teaching uh, through Dementia Training Australia, and we're actually just starting to train GP practice nurses. Um, we're piloting that program uh, in the next few months. I've been working with that with my PhD student who's a GP practice nurse who's nearly finished and has been looking at the practice nurse role in supporting people with dementia. And dementia affects everything, guys. So if the practice nurse sees someone with, with uh, diabetes, they can't just go through their usual thing with them, tell them this, tell them that, adjust your medication, this, whatever, we'll do a care plan, what's your goals of care? They have to have the carer there or the person that's supporting them and they and they need to adjust the way that they converse with that person because uh, every aspect of their health care is affected by um, the, the, the cognitive problems that they have. And we just need to, we, we need to respect that and work with them in a different way. So 
and I know that your clinics will be great, but you won't be able to reach everybody. And there's also all the people that aren't suitable for the MABs or that have dropped out for one reason or another, ARIA, or they just were one of the nine out of 10 that didn't get through the hoops. Um, and we need to look after them too. So we actually really need to do a lot of work in the post-diagnostic space in primary care as well, maybe with the PHNs. Last bit, might talk a bit more briefly about dealing with expectations. So I do remember when the colonesterase inhibitors came out, mainly family members breaking down in tears when I said to them, but it's not a cure. But they said, but I heard you found a new tablet that will cure dementia. And so the next 10 minutes is actually, you know, dealing with someone who's really upset because that was their expectation because that was their interpretation of what they heard. But you all know this. The media sometimes does exaggerate. Peter, thoughts on dealing with expectations? And we deal with it all the time as a geriatrician, as a doctor and nurse in the area. We deal with this all the time. Is the MAB going to be any different from any other dealing with expectations? Well, I think the expectations are going to be very big at the beginning. Um, but after discussing it, I think, as already mentioned, once you start talking about side, the side effects, particularly the significant side effects, I think some people are just going to say, well, we're not going down that track. But I think it, I mean, I, I think the, it's the overall care of someone who has a diagnosis of dementia that's important. And we all, when we diagnose it, we we actually go through a whole lot of treatment possibilities, which go from changes in their lifestyle to medication. And I always talk about cholinesterase inhibitors and and um, memantine and, and the future. But basically, we have to work through all that, and we always do. And I'm actually, I'll just give another example that I've actually embarked on using cannabis for people with behavioral disturbance related to dementia. And it's exactly the same thing, because people are actually coming to me asking for all asking for it for their relatives and saying, this is the panacea of life. Well, that often comes from their grandchildren who say, you better get on cannabis. But the thing is this, that I have to say to them, because I've got fairly good experience on this one now, is that there may be some improvement, but it's probably only going to be about 50% of people actually get any improvement. And that means that maybe it's placebo anyway, but we have to give them that expectation. So then we have to work through you know, the costs and the side effects and all that, and then get to a point of, are we going to trial this? And if we are going to trial it, we're going to have to follow it up. And if we're not going to trial it, well, let's support you in lots of other ways. So I think we are very used to this. And I think people will, a lot of people will be turned off it. But on the other hand, there'll be people who we will say, you really are not a candidate for it. And they're the ones we have to maybe deal with a little bit more. We have to provide a holistic approach, and some of those will probably go somewhere else and find it somehow anyway. Do you think the fact there is one big difference at the moment, well, if it comes out as it's the tens of thousands of dollars, do you think that puts extra pressure on people having those discussions? Because it would for me, right, if I'm telling someone that this is not true, right, this is going to cost tens of thousands of dollars, how do I explain the science that you're making an informed decision? Well, again, I think it's all about what it's going to do, how it's going to do it, how we're going to provide it, and what are the side effects. By that time, you probably had a few drop out, and then you you also will have to hit them with the cost. Should I engage and, my house stock? Well, some people will, but it, yeah. I mean, basically, it's their, they have to make that decision. You're not going to say, well, you better go and do it, because we know it's not. I mean, these in some people are absolutely... Um, beneficial, but in others, they're not going to be at all. And I don't think you can put that pressure on them. But the, the, there the, will be people who will say, well, I need to do anything I can, and they will. These drugs, as Peter said, tend to only be expensive in the first few years. They either go on the PBAC or the companies have competition because there's several of them in the pipeline and the, and the prices come down. So I don't see the cost as being an end of story. It's a hard 
initial hurdle, but I, I, it's only going to be an initial hurdle. Competition is going to be the key. That'll bring. Yeah, there, there will be competing drugs, and you know, Bill's told us about a trial that he did. I know that drug. We're doing it again in a phase uh, two a study, um, and it's looking really very promising. So we'll have other mechanisms to a target too, including neuroinflammation. Thank you. Um, can we all thank the panel? It's tough being put on the spot. <laughs> Ask for formal approval to have his her grandson bring in hash cookies. Said I couldn't call them. What level of pitch you had? Right. So if you, if my patient says there are pharmacists, I'm going to pitch it at a certain That's level. That's really purely my perspective. I think that is great. For example, many of the farmers would have said, "Doc, just tell it to." Me. Yes, yes. Hello. So don't go anywhere. This is the best session of the day. Um, I mean, no offense to the rest of the speakers. It's been a great program today, uh, but I'm always very excited about the rapid fire session. Uh, so we're going to be hearing from five early mid career researchers covering a wide range of topics. I'm going to be continuing the session with Jackie. I'm going to be introducing the first uh, two speakers, and then I'm going to come back to introduce the last of them. Uh, five minutes each. Shannon uh, is going to take the time. Uh, and it's my pleasure to introduce the first speaker of today, Dr. Christina Horn. Uh, Christina is doing a postdoctoral research, a postdoctoral research associate rather, based at Frontier and at the Mind Lab and the Brain and Mind Center, working with Marion. And she's going to be talking to us about understanding behavioral rigidity in young adults with dementia, the role of motivational disturbances. Thank you, Christina. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Okay, cool. All right, uh, thank you so much for the um, invitation to come and present today. I'm gonna to be talking to you about our recent work looking at behavioral rigidity in younger onset dementia, particularly the role of motivational disturbances. Um, and so, mouse, yep. Okay, great. Um, and so for anybody less familiar with frontotemporal dementia, I'm referring to a group of younger onset neurodegenerative diseases uh, that are characterized by progressive atrophy of the frontal and temporal lobes um, and associated with changes in behavior, personality, and language function. And so there are three main types of um, frontotemporal dementia, but I'm gonna be talking mainly about the first two. So the behavioral variant of FTD and semantic dementia because we know that um, both of these diseases are associated with significant motivational disturbances. So this includes apathy or the loss of motivation and a real reduction in goal-directed behaviour, as well as anhedonia, which is the loss of the ability to experience pleasure or reward. Um, and these are two overlapping but distinct uh, symptoms. And they can um, lead to a number of changes, like the person might withdraw from their previously enjoyed interests and activities. They might become less interested in social interactions and um, they might be less engaged in their self-care self tasks. Um, and they are also predictive of functional decline and carer burden. So these can be really tricky symptoms um, to manage for both the person and their carers. But at the same time as this profound loss of motivation and the um, and I guess drive and initiation in everyday life, they can, um, people with FTD can start to develop these really rigid and inflexible behaviors as well. So they can um, have specific obsessions, like they might get really into clock watching or timekeeping. They might have specific routines and rituals that they insist on doing um, every day. And they can also develop specific and unusual interests that they didn't have previously. And I've got a couple of the um, examples we've seen on the slide there. Um, and this can lead the person to put really excessive effort into these very specific activities. And they can also become quite distressed and frustrated if for some reason they're not able to do these things. Um, 
And because this does co-occur with apathy and anhedonia, we're really interested in how is it that someone with such a loss of motivation in most areas can channel so much energy and focus into these very specific um, behavioural targets. And um, that's what this study was really looking at, is whether there could actually be a link between these different types of symptoms. So whether people who are experiencing motivational problems may actually be more rigid and inflexible in their behaviour. And that's what we investigated in frontotemporal dementia. So we recruited 71 participants through Frontier and a subset of them underwent a structural MRI. And uh, the carers of the participants provided uh, ratings of apathy, anhedonia and rigidity on questionnaire measures. And um, I'll try to skip past that slide, but essentially we found that apathy and anhedonia were associated with more rigid and inflexible patterns of behaviour, which is um, what we were predicting. But the specific pattern depended on the diagnostic group. So we found that for anhedonia, there was actually a significant interaction with diagnosis such that um, hedonic tone was predicting rigidity for the semantic dementia group, but not the behavioural variant of FTD group. Whereas for apathy, the relationship between um, apathy and rigidity was comparable across the two diagnostic groups. So this tells us that in semantic dementia, there seems to be this specific role of loss of hedonic tone. Um, and we used voxel-based morphometry to link rigidity to uh, grey matter intensity and found that it was associated with changes in this predominantly right lateralized network. Um, and these regions are involved in things um, like executive function, memory and reward. So I've listed them here, but perhaps the one that's most um, interesting to us is the nucleus accumbens, because this is considered to be one of the, um, I guess, reward centres in the brain. So we're seeing a link between rigid and inflexible behaviours and changes in the brain's reward structures. Um, so overall, rigidity does appear to be linked to loss of motivation in frontotemporal dementia. Um, and while apathy was predicting rigidity in both diagnoses, there seems to be a specific role for anhedonia in semantic dementia. Um, and we have some ideas about what might be going on here. So in the case of um, apathy, it might be that they're more rigid and inflexible as a way of avoiding the cognitive effort of um, doing something differently or generating new ideas. Whereas in the case of anhedonia, it might be that there's only a few activities left that they can still get some enjoyment from. And so they narrow in and focus on those specific targets. But that's something we're going to have to look into further. Um, and as mentioned, the rigidity was associated with changes in number of brain regions, but mainly uh, reward processing was of interest to us. Um, so in future, it's going to be really important for us to develop sensitive tools to assess uh, rigidity using a more multidimensional approach. And um, we're hoping to translate these findings into targeted interventions aimed at managing some of these symptoms. So we did recently develop a guide for managing loss and motivation in dementia. And I've got a QR code up on the screen there. Um, so ideally we would develop something similar to this for managing rigidity. And big thank you to the participants and their carers, uh, Maren Irish, my supervisor and the Mind Lab and Frontier team. Thank you. Thanks, Christina. Uh, we won't be taking questions because we're going to be pressed by time, but please hang out, you know, after the for the drink so we can, uh, you know, discuss the research of this of the colleagues today. Uh, may I please uh, invite to the stage Mrs. Rachel Ju? Hi, Rachel. So Rachel is a PhD candidate uh, at the Brenner Mind Center. She's going to be talking about associations of C-reactive protein with neuropsychological outcomes in older adults at risk of dementia. Thank you. Thanks so much, everyone. Um, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Rachel, and um, yeah, today I'll be presenting my PhD research looking at C-reactive protein and neuropsychological outcomes in older adults at risk of dementia. So what could be considered at risk? Well, the normal aging process is associated with a decline in cognitive function to some extent. Um, but older adults who experience cognitive decline may be classified somewhere along this continuum of preclinical dementia. So if there's no evidence of any objective impairments, this is referred to as subjective cognitive decline or SCD. Um, mild cognitive impairment or MCI is used to classify individuals with objectively worse than expected cognitive functioning after clinical assessment. 
So individuals with SCD and MCI here have an elevated risk of progressing into these late onset dementias of Alzheimer's disease and vascular dementia. And we know, we know that up to 80% of cases show a mixed um, etiology of both Alzheimer's and vascular related pathologies. Um, and we also know that um, uh, individuals here with SCD and MCI, um, these pathological abnormalities begin to accumulate in the brain up to 20 years before any clin clinical symptoms emerge or before a diagnosis of dementia is even made. And so these at-risk periods here offer this kind of window of opportunity to investigate the markers and contributors to cognitive decline and the underlying mechanisms of disease. And in particular, there has been a recent shift in understanding inflammation and inflammatory processes as a core feature and contributor to dementia. And among a wide range of inflammatory biomarkers, C-reactive protein or CRP circulating in the bloodstream is um, the most commonly used marker of nonspecific inflammation in clinical settings and is used as both a marker and predictor of cardiovascular and cerebrovascular disease. The high sensitivity test is used to assess this kind of low grade systemic chronic inflammation. And previous studies have linked higher CRP levels to um, poorer performance in these kinds of um, cognitive um, general screening tests. Um, in a recent study by Zhang and colleagues, um, they observed that the relationship between CRP and cognition might actually differ depending on the stage of disease or decline. So you can see here with participants with subjective cognitive decline, um, higher CRP levels trended towards poorer cognition or faster decline. Um, however, in MCI, there was no relationship here. And I won't go into too much detail here, but in participants with Alzheimer's disease, there was actually an inverse relationship. So higher CRP levels was associated with um, kind of better cognition or a slowing of decline. Um, however, there is limited understanding on the association, associations of CRP with specific neuropsychological outcomes beyond these kinds of general cognitive screening tests. And understanding um, how CRP might be associated with these specific cognitive domains um, is really important for us to gain um, much deeper insight into the brain regions and the circuitry, circuitry that might be affected. And so in this present study, we aim to look at what domains of cognition CRP may be more involved in, so memory, executive function, and processing speed, and importantly, how these relationships might differ at different risk periods of dementia, so SCD compared to MCI. So the Healthy Brain Aging Clinic is an early intervention research clinic that recruits participants over the age of 50 who are experiencing new onset cognitive decline, but with no dementia. So in the final sample, we had 465 participants who were classified um, as either having SCD or MCI. High sensitivity CRP levels were grouped into categories of low, moderate, and high based on previously defined criteria. And for the outcomes, the Z-scores of multiple neuropsychological tests within the same domain were um, averaged to produce a composite score for each of the three cognitive outcomes, so memory, executive function, and processing speed. So firstly, CRP concentrations did not differ between SCD and MCI groups. Um, after controlling for um, modifiable and non-modifiable risk factors, including cardiovascular health, um, we observed that in the SCD group, higher CRP levels were associated with poorer executive function and processing speed here, but not for verbal memory. Um, in the mild cognitive impairment group, participants performed worse on cognitive testing overall, as we would expect, but um, CRP was not associated with any of these neuropsychological outcomes. So our results suggest that CRP is linked to an impairment or a disruption in this kind of frontal subcortical pathway, um, which is really important for the skills of executive function and processing speed. This region is also highly susceptible to damage from vascular inflammation and diseases, which CRP is really heavily involved in. And finally, our results also suggest that inflammation is linked to cognitive decline at this really early stage of cognitive disruption, but not when um, cognitive impairment becomes clinically evident, so in MCI. Um, and this could suggest that strategies targeting inflammation at this really early stage of cognitive disruption could be viable targets for prevention. Thank you, everyone. I'd like to welcome Belinda Johnson, who has travelled up from Canberra, thank you, drove up, to talk about driving. <laughs> Just skip. Yep. Uh, that's my hat. 
happening and to change it our own as well. Thank you very much. It's great to be here. I'm, this is a little bit of a change of pace from a lot of the presentations you've already heard today. Um, I'm actually a clinician working in Canberra and um, I've been assessing driving perhaps for about seven or eight years. And I'm also a PhD candidate and this particular um, study is a part of my um, PhD studies. Um, it's done, being done in collaboration with the Canberra Health Services and... Um, and I thank my supervisors also here. So before I start, I just need to give you a quick rundown of how driving is assessed in the ACT. And I particularly want to champion it because I think it's a really good system. Um, but referrals come in from three different areas, the main areas from medical practitioners, and they go to the licensing authority. And the key thing I want to highlight here is from there, they can make a decision on, on those referrals, but they actually usually need more medical evidence. So they take them to a meeting that is a triage meeting that involves the licensing authority, the clinical forensic medicine uh, doctors, and the occupational therapy driving assessors. And from there, the more complicated cases go to the fitness to drive clinic where they're seen by a nurse and a doctor, who make a recommendation or send them to the OTDA. And then all the, the ones that aren't as complicated can go to the driving OT driving assessor and um, where there's an off-road assessment, a clinical assessment, and then an on-road assessment. And those recommendations then all go back to the licensing authority because they're the um, key authority for making that decision. What I noticed was that the um, clinical cognitive assessments that were being used to predict whether somebody was going to be able to drive or not were different between the fitness to drive clinic and what we were doing as OT driving assessors. So they were using the ACE 3 and the OT drive home maze test and the OT driving assessors were using the maze test also, but also using drive safe drive aware, which is an assessment that was actually developed here at the University of Sydney by occupational therapists. So the aim of this study was to identify if those current clinical assessments were actually predicting the outcome of the on-road assessment and whether the results of this study was going to help us prioritise the provision of when you do an on-road assessment and guide the licensing decision. And the reason you want to prioritise the provision of an on-road assessment is um, on-road assessments are risky, uh, both to the client and to the OT and the driving instructor in the car, but also they're very expensive. And this is the other thing I want to highlight in this that I like about the ACT system. In the ACT, the government pays the OTDAs to do the on-road assessment. This is, that's the only place in Australia that that's the case. So just wanted to highlight the government there. Um, okay, so, and this was the population that we... Uh, for the study. So we haven't done the deep analysis of the data yet. We have only looked at it on face value. We've got approximately 150 drivers, probably we'll have more by the end. Um, and the majority of those actually progress to the on-road assessment. What we have found though, is that the ACE3, um, although it is you know, primarily to diagnose dementia, it's not been um, terribly predictive of an outcome on an on-road assessment. And that is because it tends to be biased against drivers with little education and, uh, sorry, biased against, yes, and biased towards those with a high education, education. And what I'm seeing in the ACT, it's a highly educated population and people will absolutely blitz the ACE but they're, they're not so good on the road. It's also biased against those with communication problems. So if they've got any sort of speech problems, it's a very verbally based assessment. Um, not seeing any clear associations with the maze test at this point, um, drive safe, drive aware appears to be predicting and um, it is, has been very accurate at predicting passes. That's been all but one driver that I've seen for so far. With the prediction of fail, I'm seeing a bit of less accuracy. And what I'm going to be really interested at looking at is whether, because I'm seeing this on face value, whether that's actually 
due to the fact of drivers who were commercial drivers or highly experienced drivers who actually maintain their ability to drive for a bit, it sort of seems like a bit longer than the general population. The other thing that we have in the ACT is we have a lot less traffic. So I think people might pass in the, um, or, or, or perhaps gain a restricted license where they wouldn't in a highly urbanised area. So that's the next stage is our deep dive into the um, into that data. Looking forward to doing that and reflecting some of those things that I've I've already mentioned. So that's it from me, and that's how I can be contacted. Thanks, Belinda. And um, do you want to get to the slides? Myrna Solon is going to talk to us now about um, medication management priorities for people living with dementia in the community. Thank you, Jackie. Thank you for that warm introduction. And thank you for the opportunity to present hot off the press results on identifying pri priorities for me managing medication resource, medication management resources for people living with uh, dementia and their carers. And I just want to highlight that this work is also being supported by the MRFF Early to Mid-Career Grant. So question is, um, why are we addressing medication management in people with dementia? Um, Over-treatment, multiple uh, medications, multiple conditions, and increasing cognitive and functional decline all contribute to the increased complexities in managing medications, which may result in medication-related harm and hospital admission for those uh, living with dementia. We also know through our uh, nationwide survey that older people with dementia and their carers have significant unmet information needs regarding medication management. So to address this issue, we uh, have set out to use a community-based partnership approach to develop and test co-designed medication management resources for people with dementia and their carers. The first step to do this is to uh, identify community-centred priorities for medication management resources, and that will be used to inform the content um, of the uh, you know, uh, resources that we're setting out to develop. So before we set out to do that, we created a medication management guidance partnership, which is a community-based collaboration between the researchers, the research advisory group and partner organisations. And we have over 23 partners that represent people with dementia, carers, healthcare professionals and national and consumer national consumer and professional organisations. And some of our partners are present here today in the audience. So shout out to Jane, who's also driven here from Canberra. So thank you. Um, prior to conducting the focus group with our partners, we also performed a literature search that helped inform the stimuli questions um, that were asked in our focus groups. And this body of work was led by my PhD student, Alex Clough. So focus groups were conducted via Zoom with our partners and we identified key terms and emergent categories based on the occurrences within the transcripts and we reached consensus through discussions among our research team. A total of 18 healthcare professionals and four consumers participated in our focus groups and the key priorities that emerged were empowerment of the person with dementia and their carers to make informed choices and medication challenges and strategy and strategies choices. So the theme on empowerment generated much discussion and encompassed informed choice and consent as well as decision making. So some of these topics that were raised in the panel discussion that we just had before this session and uh, medication challenges and strategy, strategy choices pertain to providing support and strategies to improve medication adherence, uh, including the need to fit with individual preferences and lifestyle. And secondly, remaining current with an updated medication list, particularly at transition, transitions of care, which was seen as challenging yet essential for information needs. So quickly, briefly on empowerment. Uh, one of the most frequently discussed topic was making sure the person knows their rights in medication management, and this has to start early in the person's care journey. Uh, thirdly, there was also an acknowledgement that for empowerment, for empowerment to work, there needs to be a sharing of power between the person with dementia, carer and healthcare professional. 
Secondly, participants highlighted the need for question prompts that need to be included in the resources as a tool to enhance the empowerment and for um, to, to, to be able to speak up. Lastly, participants highlighted that as people with dementia move between care settings, the challenges in medi managing medications arise specifically on how to keep an up-to-date medication list. Um, so that they, the, the, our partners wanted us, uh, to, us to provide support on how to obtain information on what up-to-date medication the person is on. So this is the first study to explore priorities for a medication management information resource from people with lived experience and healthcare professionals. And the information resource needs to highlight strategies to empower the person with dementia and their carers to help them make informed choices, provide a pragmatic and accessible information to meet their needs and provide key questions to engage healthcare providers in shared decision making. So our next phase is to conduct an online modified so, uh, Delphi survey, which some members in the audience have already received. And this is to achieve consensus on priorities identified in our focus groups um, and to collect the feedback uh, so that we can be able to use to uh, develop the resources. And I also like to um, acknowledge our large team, including CIs as well as um, Jackie. Um, thank you for your encouragement and support throughout this um, project, um, our long list of AIs and indeed our partners. Without their help and their support um, and their you know, valuable time um, committed to this project, uh, we wouldn't have been able to come up with these amazing insights. So thank you. Okay, so we have saved the best for last, actually. And um, I'd like to introduce you to Dr. Hali Kwang, who's a postdoctoral fellow at the Frontier Research Clinic at the Brain Mind Center. Hali has a lot of different interests in neuropsychology, neuroimaging, and cultural diversity in dementia. Uh, but today she's going to be talking about why matter neurogeneration in frontotemporal dementia. Thank you. Thanks. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for the opportunity to present. So I would like to uh, briefly talking, talk about frontotemporal dementia. So frontotemporal dementia refers to a group of neurodegenerative disorders, uh, which primarily affect the uh, frontal and temporal lobes of the brain. And in frontotemporal dementia, there are two main subtypes, including behavioral variant frontotemporal dementia and language variant frontotemporal dementia. And the behavioral variant frontotemporal dementia, or BVFTD, is the most prevalent one. However, um, in clinical practice, diagnosis of BVFTD is very challenging due to the um, manifestations of neuropsychiatric symptoms that can be very hard to distinguish. Diagnosis of BVFTD is also uncertain due to the heterogeneous profiles of patients over time. So according to the disease staging theory, we know that um, clinical profile, clinical symptoms, or gray matter structural changes usually exhibit less in the disease cause. cause um, and neuro, uh, while neuropathology can occur first, it is very hard to examine. Therefore, a potentially good and early biomarker for clinical symptom is um, changes in functional and structural white matter in the brain. However, uh, characterizing white matter in the brain is also very uh, challenging because of the white matter structure in our brain crossing uh, fibers everywhere and a fiber also go going to different directions. And our current understanding about white matter changes in dementia is also limited due to the, outdate, um, the outdated um, neuroimaging method. Uh, recently, a new technique uh, has been developed called fixed base analysis. So basically, in fixed base analysis, uh, the white matter changes in the brain is uh, characterized more, uh, much better and increased sensitivity. Uh, so as we can see, compared to the traditional DTI techniques, and uh, the fixed base analysis is much better to capture, uh, the, to map the white matter changes, especially in the anatomically complex regions. So the purpose of the study is to test whether fixed base analysis can be applied to better characterize why matter changes in FTD uh, to ultimately, uh, ultimately improve the diagnosis and prognosis of accuracy. 
So here are our results. So uh, for the diagnosis of BVFGD, our clinical observation have shown that uh, about 73% of concurrent ratings of empathy loss and apathy in BVFGD patients, which means if a patient is identified as having apathy, they also have 73% of um, changes to uh, be identified as having empathy loss. And this raised the question of whether empathy and apathy somehow, uh, empathy, empathy loss and apathy somehow overlap. So we look into this more further um, by including gold standard and specialized questionnaires of apathy and empathy. And the items of this questionnaire were entered into a principal com components analysis model. We also accounted for depression by including a questionnaire for depression. So here are our results. So our results indeed show that empathy loss um, somehow overlap with a component of apathy called emotional apathy. And apathy is also distinct somehow with empathy, uh, with the, specifically in the executive component of apathy. And similar for depression, depression is also uh, distinct from the, the uh, empathy and apathy. Importantly, for why matter uh, changes, uh, we found that um, so why matter um, why matter reduction also associated with the clinical profiles. So here, the overlapping component of uh, emotional apathy and empathy was associated with why matter reduction in the inferior frontal occipital um, uh, fasciculi whereas executive apathy was associated with the uh, frontal bundles. So in terms of prognosis of BVFTD, um, here we have baseline and progression results of white matter reduction. So as we can see here in the blue cluster, baseline, uh, at baseline patients show um, reduced white matter integrity in the frontal and uh, tem tempor uh, anterior temporal lobes, which is in line with our expectation. Uh, importantly, uh, over the time, uh, white matter reduction spread into a more distributed network of our brain, especially in the posterior and in the um, subcortical structure of the brain. And this significantly predicts clinical presentation of patient many years before it occurred. So key takeaways here is that fixed-based analysis uh, show potential for more accurate characterization of white matter in FTD. And under Understanding of why matter mechanism uh, can inform pharmacological and non-pharmacological interventions. And of course, there are so many things that need to be done in the why matter space. Um, and recently, the uh, brain imaging interest group within the Sydney, uh, Sydney Clinical Imaging Network has been established uh, with close collaboration with our Sydney Dementia Network. So feel free to join us if you're interested in doing more neural imaging stuff or why matter um, analysis. So thank you so much for your attention. All right, just keep clapping. Um, we need to do a big round of claps for the speakers for excellent presentations, sharing knowledge. I need to, well, does this work? Yeah, a bit of like clap and stop. This is so fun. Okay, I'd like to thank the SDN executive for putting together the program and the excellent uh, chairing. Okay, now I need a really big round of applause. This is so fun. It's more power than I've had all day. Um, for Shannon Camilleri, who really like started with us and then had to put this whole program together and she's done all the work really. And also Oksana and Harry for all their help. So really big. And now I would like to for you to give yourself yourselves a round of applause for coming. Some people all the way from Canberra. And um, please join us for drinks. You sat through a long day, so thank you so much. And drinks and snacks outside, please, and networking. <laughs>